So let's talk through every single Imperial Guard unit, both from a gameplay and a rule of cool point of view. And this time I'm joined by a very special guest. Thanks for having me on all specs. Really looking forward to going through these units. Going to be interested to see what your take is on these units that I often use every single day or in tournaments. Hello and welcome back to All Specs Tactics for a bit of a different video this time. I'm very excited to do another rare collab on the channel and a massive thank you to Mr. Mordian Glory for taking time out of his schedule to join me to talk through the guard units. It really is a treat to be able to talk through one of my favourite 40k factions with the best known guard content creator on the internet. And for this one I thought we could talk through every single guard unit in the index and roughly how we'd rate each one in game, both from a gameplay and a sort of lore and coolness point of view. The way this one will work is that we'll talk through each unit very roughly what it does in terms of its abilities. Both of us give it an in-game rating out of 5 and then just a personal point of view rating for how much we most like the unit, giving it a 1, 2 or 3 for model and rule of cool factor. So no beating around the bush for this one, let's jump straight into it. We're going to go through each and every guard unit in the index in the order that they're written in the guard index that you can download from GW. And that means that we're starting with none other than Lord Solar Leontus. If anything, he might be a unit that's just a little bit too ubiquitous in Guard Armies in 10th edition. He generates command points. He can throw out really powerful orders to anything from Bulgrins to tank commanders to super heavy vehicles, often broadcast through a Vox net from a command squad. Just the command points and the orders are kind of godly, but he even comes with free redeploys and putting stuff in strategic reserve and isn't even absolutely awful in terms of his own combat threat in himself as well. I think perhaps unsurprisingly I'm going to give him a 5 out of 5 for gameplay. I'm afraid I'm probably going to rate him kind of low with the 1 out of 3 for the lore and coolness though. He does just have a very different aesthetic to the Imperial Guard in general. Though I have seen lots of people do some really cool conversions with him, tailoring him a bit to the theme of their army. I have to agree with you all specs here. I think that Lord Solar is clearly a 5 out of 5 unit. The vast majority of army lists that myself and pretty much every guard player that I see include this bad boy leading the force. And a huge part of that is the three orders. The fact that he is a really efficient way of just getting those orders onto your tanks in comparison to some of the other sources of tank orders just makes him very, very good. And like you said, he's the only guy that can order certain units like Bulgrins and, with, uh, and the Super Heavies as well. On the law front, if there's a negative score I can give him, I'm going to give him that because it should have been Yarrick, man. It should have been Yarrick. Next up, we've got Ursula Creed. What might have previously been a max score unit, I think has taken a little bit of a dent to its reputation with the latest balanced data slate. I'm going to give her four out of five. Even though she can't do free fills of fire anymore with her tactical genius ability, she can make a lot of other stratagems now a bit cheaper. And even if fills of fire is typically the one you're going to go for, getting it for 1 CP over 2 CP is still nice. The Locust Dead ability to be able to do two wars at the same time on one unit can be useful, though I've actually found it could be a bit more situational because Creed does tend to be hiding behind the back lines. At the end of the day, though, She's very cheap and can do two orders, and that's got a lot of value in the guard. So I'm going to give her four out of five on the usefulness. I am going to give her... I think I'm going to give her one out of three on the rule of cool. That's just because I'm a, I'm a Daddy Creed fan. I, I have the old original model, model and um, also she does look a bit like a lunch lady. Yes, it looks like for me we're in agreement there. I've also chosen to rank a four out of five for gameplay and a 1 out of 3 for rule of call cool purposes. Three stratagems are really quite big, particularly when they're within any unit within 12 inches. Pretty nice to be able to do situational stuff like Overwatch and similar with regiment units now. I have to admit I would agree with Mordian on the preferring the OG Kree's, just from the era when I first started collecting the guard, and he's still certainly the model that I choose to represent Creed in game myself. Moving straight on, and we've got the Cadian Castellan, sort of the generic officer for the Cadian Shock Troops, he gives you an order to a regiment unit, sustained hits for the unit that he's leading, so a bit of a firepower boost there, and the ability to fall back and shoot. Overall for gameplay I've chosen to give him a 3 out of 5. I feel like just for practical reasons he's rarely the model that's chosen, just due to how powerful the command squad is, which isn't really also very different in points for him. I think that all of his abilities individually are good value, fall back and shoot in particular is quite nice for guard sort of infantry builds as things can get locked in combat and then just basically unable to deal their damage. He does maybe feel like a bit of a luxury pick though for any one Cadian squad moving into the midboard. I've chosen to give him a 2 on law and theme, 
Pretty much your standard issue guard officer, certainly nothing wrong with him. I do quite like the flexible miniature that Games Workshop came out with for him. So slight controversy, me and Orspex disagreeing very slightly on this model. I'm going to give him a 3.5. And the reason for that is fundamentally, he's not bad. Whenever I've used one of these in game, I've been totally happy with its performance. I think the issue with the Cadence Sterling is not that it's a bad unit, it's that it's living in the shadow of things like Creed and Strachan, officers who can do two orders. And when you look at guard officers, that's really the fundamental baseline for how useful are they. He can only do one order, but you can get around that with Grand Strategist, and that puts him in a kind of similar ballpark points-wise to those other characters like Strachan and like Creed. In terms of rule of cool, I'm going to give him a two out of three. He is just your generic guard officer. What I do like about him, though, is that for a lot of people that have made custom regiments and they don't want to use named characters, the Kane and Castellan can fill in as a pseudo Mordian company commander or a Restroyan uh, leader or something like that. So he's got a little bit of usefulness there and a little bit of coolness there for making him specific for your army. So next up, we have tank commanders. Controversial take here, a hot take indeed. I'm going to give it a four out of five. Now, yes, they are expensive. And yes, they can only do one order. And yes, you need to give them grand strategists to really be useful. But we are entering into a new era of Warhammer 40k, a new season. And I think more so than ever, mechanized guard is going to be really important, especially with the way that a lot of vehicles now, not the tank commander, but a lot of vehicles get lethal hits when shooting other enemy vehicles and monsters and going down that sort of mechanized route you're trying to fit in lots of chimeras trying to fit in lots of tanks and what i found is if you go down the traditional lord solar route you end up spending the, a lot of points that could have gone on to tanks on the lord solar if you go for the tank commander it's like a double package you're getting a lehman russ in your list and that Liam Russ can do orders and support the rest of your army. So you're not having to spend points on the Lord Solar and five Liam Russes. You can just get five Liam Russes in your army. So because of that, I think he's really useful and he's much less susceptible to indirect fire, splitting your command blob apart and compromising your order potential. So he's getting a four out of five for me with the new meta that I think we're going into. As for rule of cool, it's similar to the Caden Castellan, right? It's kind of just down the middle. He's a generic tank commander, so he can have uh, he can have two out of three because guard tanks are always cool, no matter what. Seems there's no real debate for me on that one either. I certainly still rate the tank commanders as a pretty strong unit, even if they didn't get the lethal hits handed out with the born soldiers against monsters and vehicles in the latest updates. It still seems that tank commanders are at least fairly popular picks in competitive guard lists particularly with Grand Strategist, as Morning Glory says. So I feel like I probably still want to run them alongside Lord Solar in more optimised lists, just due to the fact that Lord Solar can order them and still get them hitting accurately or zooming super fast and things. That Fire and Death is absolutely massive as well. On a 2+, plus, it just gives you the consolation prize of potentially deleting something very powerful that was about to deal a whole bunch of damage in your own turn, so that can be very nasty indeed. And extra orders thrown around on the front lines to squadron units is pretty great. I've also chosen to go for the two out of three on the rule of cool thing. Everyone loves a tank commander trying to drive closer so he can hit you with his sword. Next up we have the command squads which I thought I'd cover together as there's only a few subtle differences between the two. Really quite an interesting guard unit with the option for medipacks for feel no pain, extra OC from the standard, a master vox to broadcast orders around which could potentially join the same squad as Lord Solar to get his orders flying around extra far. And he can also take things like a mortar in the command squad to hand out a bit of fields of fire at extreme long range on things that you can't see. The regular one can allow some stratagems nearby if the unit's battle shocked, and has far greater choice of unit selection. The Cadian one allows a bit of ignores modifiers. Out of the two, I'd rate the platoon one as the stronger one, probably giving it the full 5 out of 5 for strength, just really useful to have in the army broadcasting orders from safely at the back. For law and fail, again, I'm going to give them a 2 out of 3. Nice to be able to fly the regimental colours with the banners. The Cadian one, I'd say, is a bit more limited in scope just due to the squads that they can join. It's Cadian shock troops or nothing, but I sort of feel like it's more a bit of a war gear sort of choice and selection, more so than being an entirely different unit in my mind. I have to agree with all specs on this one. The platoon command squad has to be a 5 out of 5. I cannot tell you the last time I ran a 
serious hybrid guard or competitive tournament guard list where I didn't have one of these things in there. Whether you've got them as part of your Lord Solar Command Blob or you've got them leading units of infantry forward, they always have some kind of function, some kind of role in your army. For rule of cool, I am going to go for three out of three. And this is a personal one here. One of the first pictures I ever saw of the Imperial Guard was the old Cadian Command Squad when they got remade and they got the sort of the aesthetic that we're familiar with now. And there was a command commander with his command squad holding out in a ruined building while the guardsmen around him fought for their lives. And that was just the first pitch you saw in the old fourth edition guard codex. So that really stuck with me. And it just feels like this unit embodies everything it means to be a guard officer. You're there, you're leading your men, you've got the flag waving in the wind whilst your advisors are trying to, you know, tell you what's going on and you've got to make orders. It just feels like the Imperial Guard unit. Next up, we have my boy, my main man, Colonel Ironhand Strachan. I love this unit and I, I'm going to say it's a five out of five for usefulness and a lot of people are going to think, Mordi, you're just saying that because you like the big muscly abs. And that is true. That is true. That's certainly why he's getting a three out of three for rule of cool. But genuinely, I think Strachan is an incredibly useful unit that a lot of people are overlooking. Firstly, fundamentally, he is an officer that can do two orders for a really, really good price point. And that on its own is enough to justify putting him in your list. But secondly, I cannot tell you the number of times I have put this guy in one of my tournament lists. And just by having that little seasoning, that little bit of close combat potential, it has given me an extra tool in my toolbox. It has allowed me to pull off a crazy maneuver that has turned a game or allowed me to even win a game. Strachan is just that extra bit of punch that you need when the guns sometimes don't go your way, when the dice sometimes don't roll the way you need them to. You've got Strack in your list, he can pull out that big knife, he can go charging in, and I have had him kill everything from Nightbringers to Hive Tyrants, and I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't had him in my list. So he gets max score for me. For the Colonel myself, I've chosen to give him a 4 out of 5 for gameplay. I must admit, he's a very satisfying unit to use. Just charge in alongside some Kaschan scouting up the board a really long way, and then just utterly delete a squad of, say, Space Marines or something. Rerolling hit and wounds on the charge with that very generalist profile is just incredibly scary. For the points, I feel like he's a really good value. I just feel like he's maybe not as much of an absolute essential in every army list. I feel like there's just quite a lot of value in keeping the cast chance squads cheap to do the dying on the front lines. For rule of cool, I've chosen to give him a 2 out of 3. He's a pretty awesome guy with some cool rules. I do like his whole thing of punching Xenus monstrosities into the dirt. Next up, we've got the otherworldly powers of the Primaris Psyche. A cheapish leader that can both do a bit of damage and defense, psychic maelstrom for a bunch of strength 6 damage 2 attacks, potentially with devastating wounds if he hits hard, and then psychic barrier for a 4 plus invulnerable save against enemy attacks. They can make, say, a deathcore Krieg block just incredibly hard to take down with any sort of firepower. Overall, I've chosen to give them a 3 out of 5 for in-game power. They definitely have their place, though I feel like you have to have the right squad to be able to justify them, really. It can be seriously nasty if the Death Corps Krieg block gets depleted and they get the plus one to hit and wound from that with those psychic attacks, though I guess that's a little bit situational. For Rule of Cool, gone for a two out of three on that one. When I use one of these, I certainly think back to Dawn of War with the psychers yelling, witness your doom and all that. I'm in alignment with all specs here. The Primaris Psyche can feel amazing and it can feel useless. It's a, quite a situational unit. I have used these guys with Scions jumping out of Torx Primes and they've had four rolls to hit, four rolls to wound with their Psychic Maelstrom on the full blast and it can be devastating. And I've had these guys lead Blobs of Krieg and they can feel really durable. But sometimes you have matchups where those abilities just aren't working. They're just not feeling right. They're just not good. Like it's all well and good to have a four plus invulnerable save against shooting and then you get paired into World Eaters and yeah, that four plus invulnerable save is just... A waste of time and half the reason you brought this guy is no longer relevant so because of that i'm going to put him right down the middle on a 2.5 out of 5 because sometimes he's a zero and sometimes he's a five the big thing with him though is it's you've got to build around him you've got to have a plan for him in your list you can't just chuck him in there Rule of cool, well, I'm an old school guard player. I was taught not to have psychers in your list. Don't trust the witch. Suffer not the witch to live. So he's going to have to have a, a, a one out of three. Otherwise, the commissar might tell me off.
Next into the breach, we have got Gaunt's Ghost, a favorite in a lot of competitive lists. I'm going to give them a 4 out of 5, which some people might disagree with. Some people would say they're a solid 5 out of 5 unit. The number one thing that people take them for in tournaments is their covert stealth team ability. It's a little bit like a Cardus Assassin. You can pop up and pop down in uh, and get secondaries. Now, the reason I give them a 4 out of 5 is because they're a little pricey. I, I like quantity over quality. And I find with Gaunt's Ghosts, yes, they can pop up and down, but they're only one unit. So if you draw an objective like behind enemy lines, then you can only get a little bit of points on that rather than getting max points for if you took two units of Scions, which cost the same as these guys. Also, with only having one unit, it means there's a little bit less flexibility in there. What if you draw established locus and, beh and behind enemy lines in one turn? Well, you might be able to get one of those objectives. You might be able to get both, but not max out the score on them. I just feel like they're a very good unit, but they can only do so much. And having a couple of cheap units can sometimes achieve the same results. And give you a few extra options. Rule of cool, I have to say, it's three out of three. Gaunt's Ghost, best series of Black Library novels ever written. Best Gaunt's Ghost book, in my opinion, either Necropolis or Traitor General. Seems I've gone just a little bit higher on the in-game score for the Gaunt's Ghost compared with Morty and Glory there. I've given them a 4.5 out of 5 for me. I just feel like they're a unit that's just got such a huge amount of options that you can do with them. I've got ways to influence the game in a number of ways. Obviously doing secondaries with the jumping on and off the board is great. I really like just chipping away with a little bit of random chip damage with the sniper rifle and the auto cannon and a few last shots at long range. You genuinely can take a few wounds off some important units that you can get lines of sight on. I really like the way that they can issue orders when they return to the board now. And that could be really valuable if you can get things like that off on frontline units that otherwise wouldn't be important enough to order. Plus they can be fun late game for doing some charges onto objectives, maybe swinging things when you know that you don't really need to preserve them anymore and they can just have a last ditch attempt to score you a few more victory points. With the rule of cool factor, I've also chosen to give them a 3, the first unit I've chosen to so far for these. Really lovely miniatures that have enjoyed painting up early in 10th edition, or some characters from the lore, and just really fun in game. I feel like they're just all around a pretty cool unit to put on the table. Next up we've got the Regimental Attaches. For 40 points you get a Master of the Ordnance, an Astropath, and an Officer of the Fleet. They give you a few interesting buffs to other units on the board and attached to a command squad. Out of the three I'd rate the Master of the Ordnance as the most relevant one. The same hits for artillery is pretty nice, particularly given that quite a lot of other buffs are locked out for them now. And the Astropath isn't all four for a bit of reserve denial, but given that he's going to be in quite a big squad anyway most of the time, it maybe isn't quite as relevant as it could be elsewhere. I've chosen to give them a 2 out of 5 for gameplay, I've very rarely seen these guys taken in 10th edition, even the Master of the Ordnance is just a little bit unreliable for delivering that buff, as often you might want to be hitting things with artillery that are out of line of sight that he can't see anyway. For rule of call, I've given them a 2 out of 3, maybe being a little bit generous there, I think it would have been 2 or 1 for me. I feel like these guys are kind of fun though, I just like the idea of the artillery commander just yelling at the basilisks to shatter their sky and bring down a bunch of artillery fire upon the target. I really want to like regimental attaches. I really do. I've used them a number of times, but they're just a bit rubbish. <laughs> I think a lot of their abilities like sustained hits and the artillery commander sounds good until, like you pointed out, you, you can't see with him because the artillery is simply shooting stuff out of line of sight. You're going after those five men units sitting on objectives. The yeah, Aeronautic Commander on paper is really useful until you realise that aircraft are completely gimped in 10th edition, so he's not really doing much either. And the Astropath has got some uh, pretty good uh, usability with that 12-inch deep strike denial. But like I said, you can often spread out, and Gar doesn't really have a problem with screening. And if you want a really good screening unit, you want to go for the Inquisitorial Henchman, who basically costs the same as a Guard Blob, and yet can get two of these 12 inch denial bubbles and let me tell you that can win you a game single-handedly just completely screening out something like gray knights so for me they they're gonna have to have a one out of five there's very few times when these guys are more than a fluff pick in your army for rule of cool i think these models are really characterful i mean the sculpting on each one the Fleet officer looks like a, a sneering, snobby type. The astropath is clearly peering into something we can't quite see. And the artillery commander reminds me of um, 
bit of a bar art reference here. It reminds me of one of the characters from the first Last Chances book. Uh, so really, really cool um, set of models. So I'm going to give it a two out of five for a rule of cool, but I'm going to give them a one out of five for usefulness. So the Ogryn bodyguard. Now, Ogryn's fundamentally are kind of cool, but unfortunately for these guys, they're just not very useful. I find the problem with them is they've got an all right level of close combat, but there's a lot of taxes involved. You've got to take a command squad for them to attach to, and then that command squad's going to want to be in an infantry squad of some kind. So by the time you get there, you're not paying like whatever it is, like 40 points for an Ogryn bodyguard. You're paying a lot more for it. And that's for a unit that, really should just be moving on to objectives and kind of dying. Now, there is some play for Ogre Bodyguards if you're going down a meme sort of close combat guard build, and that can be fun, but it's not exactly sort of S-tier meta changing or anything like that. So the basic Ogre Bodyguard, I'm just going to give a 2 out of 5. Uh, if a ruler call just down the middle, I'll give him a 2.5 out of 5. But then we have Nork Deadog. Nork Deadog is such a cool character. The fact that Nork Deadog is still in the guard roster and Yarrick isn't is hilarious to me because somehow Nort Deadog is like this 400 year old ogre that's still going strong. So for, in terms of his rules, he actually does have some pretty decent combat capability and taking Strachan and Nork and putting them in a 10 man catch and squad with a command squad can actually get you a very powerful close combat unit. So I'm going to give Nork a little bit more usefulness. Again, it's a bit of a mean build, but I am going to give it a 3 out of 5 on that front. Rule of cool, he's got to have the 3 out of 3. It's Nork Dead Dog. He was in, like I think, our first codex. He's got to be He's got to be the max score on the rule of cool. Yes, for usefulness for these two, I feel like they are unfortunately just not particularly competitive picks for the Imperial Guard right now. Generally, you're paying a lot of points to add a bunch of sort of melee muscle might and a little bit of durability to an overall guard unit, when realistically most of the time you don't really want that unit in combat too much anyway. I feel like they're the sort of unit that just once every few games they might surprise you and do something really powerful, keeping a unit alive when they otherwise might have died. But I feel like for their points they just don't really add enough durability or enough threats to really change how you play the guard unit all that much. I've chosen to give them both a 2 out of 5 for that. Not completely useless, but barely going to get picked in optimised play. I've chosen to give them a 2 out of 3 for Rule of Cool. They definitely have some good fun factor. I really like the Ogrim bodyguards just loyally defending their senior officer at all costs. Next up, we're into the guard rank and file. And first up, we have the infantry squad. There's four different flavours of infantry squad in the guard index, more defined by their war gear and the special rules that they get, more so than other major differences but it does mean that they can play really quite differently. A standard infantry squad is the one that gets a heavy weapon, so it can be a bit more use at extreme long range, and they also get defenders of humanity for the benefit of cover when they're on objectives. I feel like for the right role that you might have for them, they can be the right choice. These guys may be wanting to play a bit more defensive compared with some of their counterparts, like the Tanky Creed or the Scouting Catachans, though I feel like most of the time I tend to be skewing towards some of the others, unless going through a very heavy infantry build where you might want a few las cannons or things hidden in tough blocks. I've chosen to give them a 3.5 out of 5 for in-game power, with a full 3 out of 3 for lore and feel. I do really like fielding Horde Guard on the tabletop. There's just something kind of awesome about mass ranks of humanity trying to take down the various Xenos and Chaos Horrors that they might come up against in Warhammer 40k. Ah, the infantry corps! Every day in the corps like a day on the farm. Every meal a banquet, every paycheck a fortune, every formation a parade. I love the corps! I'm a big infantry guard fan, and the infantry squad is the bread and butter of the guard. You will find these things in pretty much every guard army out there, both competitive and casual. On a casual front, you tend to find that a lot of old school guard players, people who have got those old metal heavy weapon teams or whose collections are based around before the different infantry squads got their own specific data sheets. They're the kind of players that are using these as their, as their battle line infantry. But on a competitive point of view, these things crop up all the time. You don't see them spammed left, right and centre, but these are often the glue that is holding together your command squads. Like you'll have Lord Solar with a command squad attached to an infantry squad so that they can do a little mortar round. Or you'll have Creed attached to an infantry squad with a mortar, which helps facilitate that whole cheaper fields of fire. So from a usefulness point of view, I'm going to give them a 4.5 out of 5. Because not only do they have great use in a competitive list, but they're 
also just really generally useful for any guard player, whether you're starting out now or whether you're a bit of a long beard. Rule of cool, you can make these incredibly flavorful with things like the old metal Mordian Iron Guard, or you can even just make the new Cadians into them as well with the new heavy weapon teams, but they are a little generic at the end of the day. So I'm going to give them a two out of three just sort of put it right down the middle for whether you're going for just a newer kind of one or if you're using those older metal models. Then we have the Cadian Shock Troops, the poster boys of the Imperial Guard. Now, on the one hand, these guys are useful. They are cheap. You can get special weapons in them. But like the Cadian Castellan, they are overshadowed by some of the other infantry choices that we'll be looking at later on, like the Death Corps of Krieg. I mean, if you want a cheap infantry squad, you can go for Catachans, they're cheaper. If you want something that's got more special weapons in it, you can go for Krieg. So I think that because of this, I'm going to have to give them only a three out of five on the usefulness point of view. And in terms of the rule of cool, they are the poster childs. So I think they do suffer a little bit from the sort of ultramarine issues where because you see them all the time, they're not quite as cool as some of those other regiments that you have. So I'm going to give them just down the middle a two out of three on the rule of cool. They're not uncool, but they don't really do anything for me. Yep, full agreement for me on the Cadian shock troops. I just feel like they're usually going to be overshadowed by one of the other infantry variants. Cheap cast chance to do some scouting things. Krieg with their med packs and their extra special weapons. Their shock troops objective scoring rule can be kind of helpful for a bit of sticky objectives. I feel like sticky objectives maybe comes up a little bit less for guard compared with some other armies, often having multiple units taking midfield points. I've chosen to give them a 3 out of 5 for in-game power, and again a 2 out of 3 for rule of cool factor, these guys being pretty much your standard guard infantry. Next up we've got everyone's favourite gas mask wearing, shovel wielding trench fighters in the Death Corps of Krieg. Compared with the other infantry squads, they get their nice damage boost when they've taken casualties, a bunch of special weapons, including a plasma, melter and grenade launcher if you like, and the very useful med pack to restore D3 models to the unit. I feel like between all that, they are worth the extra 5 points over the regular infantry squad and Cadians, unless you are looking for the mortar, as Mordian says, for handing out fields of fire. But I feel like between arguably having by far the best damage output out of the infantry squads, and also the ability to regenerate, which can be kind of massive in your command phase on objectives, they are one of my favourite infantry squad variants, often worth the upgrade, and you can also build around them for excessively tanky blocks with, say, a primary psyker and a 5 plus feel no pain for a marshal. Overall, I've chosen to give them a 4 out of 5 for in game power, and a full 3 out of 3 for lore and feel. I feel like they've got a really awesome and 40k aesthetic and a pretty cool backstory. Ah, the Death Corps of Krieg, or as I like to call them, we wish we were Armageddon Steel Legion. Now that I've annoyed about half of the guard community, I'll take it a bit more seriously. These guys are great. These are your go-to hardcore infantry. They are chock full of special weapons, and thanks to Grim Demeanor giving them plus one to hit, that you can stack. I don't know how many times I'd say this. You can stack it with take aim. You can have guards when hitting on twos. Eat your heart out, custodians, is what I say. Also, when they get below half strength, and bear in mind, the first half of the models have all got lads guns, so you don't really mind if they die, you start getting plus one to wound, that's when they go from just being taken damage, just from, you know, doing a little bit of tickling, to actually, we're bringing down some big boys. So, Death Corps Krieg, they get a really solid 4.5 out of 5 for me. They are my go-to battle line infantry. They do it all. They tank damage, and they dish it out. Rule of cool wise, I am an Armageddon Steel Legion fanboy, but I think you've got to give the Kriegers, you've got to give them the three out of three. They are, as you said, they just they just fit in with 40k. They're grim, they're dark, they're world of one in space. You've got to have that three out of three. But on the complete other end of the spectrum, we have the army of Rambo, the Katachan jungle fighters. Now, in terms of usefulness, they're getting a 5 out of 5, which some people may find surprising, but these guys are awesome. They're dirt cheap per squad, and you can run them as big 20-man blobs and just dump a load of objective control onto an objective early thanks to their 6-inch scout move. Or you can do what I've been doing recently and put them inside dedicated transport where that scout move actually goes onto, for example, the Chimera. 
being able to scout forward is vitally important. It can get you early primary. It can get you early screening out from factions like Grey Knights. It can put you in position to get secondaries early or later on in the game. And it just allows you to seize the initiative. I often say on my channel, movement wins games and Katachans are some of the speediest infantry out there thanks to that scout move. Also, a couple of flamers really isn't a bad thing to have when, again, you put them in the back of a Chimera and you can have a Chimera with double heavy flamer and then these guys are two flamers and you're getting a Hellhound with a whole bunch of objective control inside of it. So I'm going to give them a 5 out of 5 for usefulness and rule them cool. Ah, uh, do I dare give them a 3 out of 3? I mean, they, <laughs> they are very badass, but I'm going to mark them down 2.5 out of 3 because the current models that they have are frankly awful. But if we had the old metal ones, I would give them a 3 out of 3. But yeah, it's got to be a 2.5. For gameplay, I'm pretty well in agreement with that. Kastchan Jungle Fighters are perhaps one of my favourite infantry units to field, just because they're so cheap at only 55 points per 10 guys. Excellent expendable units to throw a bunch of objective control into the midfield, force your opponent to have to come out and deal with them if they want to stop you from scoring objectives. I fully agreed on the Chimera thing. I feel like it's very hard to go wrong with a cheap Chimera with a unit of these guys in them. You can stack so many wounds on lighter infantry out there. And just a pain to deal with between an armoured hole and an entire squad of guys falling out of it. I chose to give them a 4.5 of 5 on the gameplay front. Probably going to annoy some people down in the comments, but I'm afraid I've not been as generous on the rule of cool sort of factor. I have given them a 1 out of 3 for that. I've personally not really gelled with their aesthetic as much as some of the guard. I still think an army of Space Rambo Guard is still kind of fun. Maybe it's not quite my thing as some of the other things. I've generally had converted models from my Kastchan things in my own Morcadian themed force. As Mordian says though, if at least they'd had good models, I probably would have put them at a 2. I feel like these miniatures felt dated when I first started collecting Warhammer 40k, and that was around about 20 years or so ago now. It's just really painful to see them with such horrible models, where well, they've done quite nice updates for Kastchans recently. The Command Squad was a significant update and that was from ages ago, never mind the actual recent cast chance corps that they came out with for limited edition miniatures. Next up we've got the Man the Myth the Legend Sly Marbo himself, the sneaky one man army and the guard lone operative, going stealth mode up the board and bumping off isolated enemies with either his Ripper Fist or, or his Envenomed Blade. Cheap lone operatives are just generally handy to have in Warhammer 40k. It's got a couple of fun supporting rules, such as returning fire and being able to move after shooting, so he could potentially be popping out, taking shots, and then hiding again. And he gets precision on his attacks, so he could potentially have the chance to bump off some characters. He could be a bit hit or miss. Unfortunately, I feel like he probably doesn't offer quite as much as things like the Assassins or Gaunt's Ghosts, even if he's a bit cheaper. Not having the option to deep strike, I think, is a bit of a downside for 10th edition missions, where actions have come to the fore recently. I've chosen to give him a 3 out of 5 for gameplay. Not really seen him in too many competitive lists since 10th edition came out. I've given him the full 3 out of 3 for law and feel, though. I feel like with the memes and fun factor for him, it'd be rude to give him anything else. Slam Arbo is one of the coolest models in the game, not just the guard. When you get the opportunity to rock a miniature with a 1980s flat top, you take that opportunity. The problem I have with him is he's such a missed opportunity in terms of his rules. I feel like he should be a budget Cardus assassin. He should be going up and down. That's what he used to do in previous editions. And now, like Fighting a Shadow, just doesn't feel that impactful, doesn't feel that fun. It doesn't feel like he's working. And I've never found a reason to put him in my list. And I've always found him to be kind of overpriced. So on a usefulness point of view, I'm giving him a 1 out of 5. I've never seen anyone run him outside of diehard Katachan players. And I think there's a very good reason for that. Rule of call though, infinity out of 3. Kazakin squad, ready for war. The Cadian Elite, the Kazakin. A very cool unit and one that's got a lot of usefulness on the tabletop. They get loads of special weapons, which gives them the ability to do quite a bit of damage. And that cheeky Melter Mine can cause some real headaches for your opponent. Little side note on the Melter Mine, what a lot of people don't realize about it is it's at the start of any phase. So you could get into combat with someone and you can stick a Melter Mine onto them. It's a really, really cool bit of war gear. 
I like their abilities as well. Scouts, six inches. It's good for all the reasons that we mentioned with the Katachans. And Warrior Elite means that they can order themselves as well as receive orders from officers. This can allow you to double stack orders on them. And having a unit with take aim and first rank fire, second rank fire, or move, 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 and take aim can make these guys either very punchy or make them very, very fast. They have taken a few knocks recently. They were a bit cheaper. They've gone up in points. They've come down a little bit in points. Bearing that in mind, I think I'm going to give them a 4 out of 5 on usefulness. If they were still 100 points, I think I'd give them the 5 out of 5. In terms of rule of cool, they're badass. They're just stone cold killers. And if any of you have read the Eisenhorn series, you will know the best story about these guys. So they're going to get a 3 out of 3 on rule of cool for me. Seems I'm in agreement in the Katakin Squad's rules in game. I've given them a 4 out of 5 for that. Great for all the reasons mentioned. They can be a particularly interesting choice for reinforcements, given that they can have their order from off the board, basically. Turning up with a whole bunch of special weapons to deal damage on a Vengeance, hitting on a 2+, plus potentially. I'd also probably refrain from giving them the 5 out of 5. Now they're 110 points now. Definitely a unit with some massive options, but if they get caught out or aren't able to do as much damage as you'd like them to before they go down, you could be a bit out of pocket there. For all of cool, I was very happy when these guys came back from the distant past. Really nice to see Games Workshop remake a classic. I've given them a 2.5 out of 5 for that. I think it was fun to have the old school stormtroopers back to some extent, with maybe the more practical and guard sort of aesthetic, as opposed to the sort of baroque armour of the Scions. Next up, we've got the Ministorum Priest. 35 points for a melee buffing character, giving a unit sustained hits 1, plus a tiny little bit of personal melee that re-roll the hit roll, but it's not exactly all that impactful when he only has a power weapon. For its intended purpose, I've chosen to give him a 1 out of 5 here, really. It's just a bit disappointing that he can't actually join any units that seriously want to be in combat. He can't go with Bulgarin anymore, which was perhaps his favourite home before. And I feel like realistically, it's just a bit of a meme trying to make cast chans extra party in close combat. I think I'd just take Strachan with them if you wanted to do that and not buy him in as an extra. Perhaps for competitive use, you maybe could get some use out of him, just literally being a 35 point unit to turn up from strategic reserves to do secondaries or something. But that seems maybe a little bit counter to what he wants to do. And you could even do that cheaper with a commissar or something if you wanted. I'm afraid I've chosen to give him kind of maximally low marks for this one. A 1 out of 5 for gameplay. And I've also chosen to give him a 1 out of 3 for just general law and feel for me, I'm afraid. It's just not really the side of the guard that I gel with quite as much. Plus, probably either need some new rules to represent the new preacher with the Zealot's Vindictor, or new miniature to represent this one. Let me preach his name! Oh, regimental Preacher. I want it to be good. I'm willing it with all my might to be good, but it's frankly awful. <laughs> oh no. I'm going to give it a 0 out of 5, man. You can't use him for secondaries. There's better choices for that, like you said with the Commissar. And I've actually run a combat guard meme army, and this guy didn't make it into the list because there were other characters that did it better. When the Tech Priest Engine Seer is a more attractive melee character than the Regimental Preacher, you, you just know that the preacher is not doing its job. It's just fundamentally just not working. So zero out of five for me. Rule of cool. I actually really like the sort of crazed zealot side of the guard. There are some regiments that are famous for their faith in the emperor. And also, mate, I don't want to end up in the eye of terror. I don't want to end up in the warp. I want to make sure that, you know, I get to dine by the emperor's table. So I am going to give him a, a two out of three on the rule of cool. Do you know what my favorite thing about Warhammer 40k is? It's when Sergeant Harker says, it's Harkin time, and then Hark's all over the place. Sergeant Harker is one of the unique Katachan characters, and he's sort of just stuck around since the 5th edition Codex, and when other named characters have fallen by the wayside, somehow he's still here. In terms of his rules and his usefulness, he's okay. He's not bad. He's not great, not terrible. 3.6 Ronkin. So I'm gonna I will give him actually a 3.6 out of 5, just for the Chernobyl reference. Harker's Hellraisers means that he can lead a squad of Katachans, and that does mean that whilst he is leading them, range attacks subtract one from the hit roll, which can make them surprisingly durable. Although I have to admit, I often forget he has that ability. But the main reason you're taking him is it's payback time. 
once per battle, he can just go completely bonkers. Hold down the trigger on that heavy bolter until you hear the click. And his gun gets six shots with sustained hits three. It can really spike in the amount of damage, but you definitely have to pair him with some extra AP. Maybe Fields of Fire, maybe an Exterminator, or even just a Hellhound ignoring cover. Because Payback, which is his heavy bolter, is good, and he can hit on twos with it, but it's only AP1. So the moment someone's in cover, sometimes it can really dampen its usefulness. Overall... He's going to get a 2.5 out of 5. He's definitely more of a fluff pick, but he does have some use in there. And he can actually order unit of Catachans as well. So he's a cheap source of orders for just 40 points. Rule of cool? I don't know what it is. He, just, he doesn't really do anything for me. He's, he, I'm told he's badass. The Codex tells me he's badass, but he's not like Marbo. He's not like Straka. Maybe he's living in their shadow a little bit. So he can have just a 2 out of 3 for that as well, down the middle. I feel like Sergeant Harker is one of the characters that I really want to be quite good. I do quite like the cheap characters that can buff squads and just contribute a little bit of extra damage and defence for not all that much. I feel like he's perhaps in the awkward situation where he nearly gets there but not quite for me. He make his Kastachan jungle fighter unit a lot more expensive and in general I quite like to have them to be really quite expendable. The minus one to hit is useful enough. His own heavy bolter does genuinely chip in damage particularly on the payback time turn and getting an extra order in them is great. I feel like it maybe just about adds up to his points worth of value. But realistically, I think if I'm going to take a supporting character for the Kastachan jungle fighters, it's going to be Strachan literally every time. For that reason, I've only chosen to give him a 2 out of 5 for that. I feel like just the heavy bolter damage maybe isn't quite as general purpose as it used to be in 10th edition 40k as well. So I've decided to give him a 2 out of 3 for sort of lore and coolness. you just got to respect a guy carrying around a heavy bolter of that sort of scale and blazing away at the enemy. Moving on, we've got some support from the Mechanicus in a Tech Priest Engine Seer. A cheap support character that you can sit by your tanks, giving them a 4 plus invulnerable save and healing D3 lost wounds. He can be surprisingly fighty as well, particularly if a vehicle has been taken down near him. He could be hitting with a pretty crazy 7 attacks at strength 6, AP 2 and damage 2, which to be honest just feels frankly kind of unlikely that he can be hitting in a similar sort of style to a Space Marine Captain or something. Plus he can be useful enough to have around for doing actions and things and just weirdly standing in the open and not being shot if he is next to a vehicle. For in-game use, I've chosen to give him a 4 out of 5. I feel like I would have been a bit lower before the latest updates, but given that Dawn's got so good, I feel like one of those really isn't the worst choice in the world to give your big chunky battle tank a 4 plus invulnerable save and a bit of healing up the board. Maybe not a completely essential pick for every single army, but I do really quite like them. The invulnerable save could be a little bit hit and miss, sometimes it's going to be great against excessively high AP things, but sometimes it might not matter all that much with cover, a little bit matchup dependent maybe. For rule of cool, I do quite like the whole aesthetic of your little guy from Mars putting the tanks back together while the guns keep firing, I've given him a 2 out of 3. Overall, I am in agreement with all specs here. The Engine Seer is a great tool to have in your army, and he brings a lot to the table. The 4 plus vulnerable save can be a little situational with cover, but when it comes up, it can be so useful, and you just praise the Omnisire that you took him in your list. Being able to repair D3 wounds as well can sometimes not only just give you a bit more health back on your tank, but it can take a degraded tank into non-degraded anymore, which helps you do damage. And it can a little be a little bit psychologically wearing for your opponent if they get one of your tanks down, like, yes, I've almost killed it. And then next turn, you just boop, three wounds back on it. And they've got to try again to even harder to bring that tank down. The lone optimum ability can be really good if you're doing some secondaries, especially with prior nexus, when you have to sometimes survive the following turn. Having a tech with engines here in the middle, maybe doing a sabotage, maybe doing a recover assets, and just having a couple of tanks around him takes an objective that might normally be hard to achieve and make it actually relatively easy to achieve. And finally, the combat ability is wild. I ran a meme combat army. I had three engine seers with servitors in there, and the amount of just power fist kind of attacks that they're putting out was awesome. Combine them with Krieg and with fixed bayonets and you can get those seven attacks plus the ones that servitors are bringing. You can get a lot of them to like hitting on twos, hitting on threes, which is really, really nice. So overall, the engines here, I agree with all specs' score here. Going to give him a, a four out of five and a two out of three. Then we have the Munitorum servitors. Now we should probably enjoy these models whilst we can, because if 
the other codexes or anything to go by, servitors aren't going to be in the game for all that much longer. But whilst we've got them, I think they're a semi-useful unit. Being able to add them to an engine seer, and then you can add them and the engine seer to a blob of guard is kind of cool. It means you can benefit from orders. It means if they're part of units like Krieg, they can start getting plus one to hit, which gets past their, frankly, horrendous ballistic skill. And also you can get plus one to hit in combat, which makes them weirdly punchy between them and the engine seer. But I think they're good in specific builds. They're an okay unit. I'm not going to give them particularly high score and usefulness. For the, every man on the street, they're probably a 2 out of 5. And in terms of rule of cool, they're all right. But there are way cooler units in the guard than these guys. So I'm going to give them a 1 out of 3. I'm fairly similar on the servitors, to be honest. OC0 became a lot worse in the Pariah Nexus missions for doing secondaries and things. Even if a 35-point unit can be interesting enough just to screen out areas of the board. I feel like for Guard though, if you're going for them, I'd much rather go for something like 50-point Scions or 55-point Kaschan Jungle Fighters, just getting so many more bodies on the board and potentially a little bit more accurate threat. I'm personally not really all that convinced by piling them into an infantry squad alongside a Tech Priest. I'd much rather have the Tech Priest just standing by the vehicles and using lone operative protection and being able to go around doing his own thing as needed. For in-game use, I've given them a 1.5 out of 5. And again, for Rule of Call, cool, I've given them a 1 as well. I feel like Servitors are kind of fun within the whole Warhammer 40k setting, but maybe just not really adding anything particularly unique or flavourful to the guard. Next up, we've got the Sinister Lurking Commissar for the 30 points, making sure that order's maintained in the ranks with the barrel of a bolt pistol. I feel like as often seems to be the case for the guard, being mostly locked to morale type things just isn't a great thing for the Commissar. He can cancel Battleshock at the start of any phase, which is handy but doesn't necessarily protect you against scoring objectives as that happens at the end of the command phase with no chance to trigger it. And the re-rolling Battleshock test per unit is alright, but I feel like it is something that you are just gambling on the squad, both failing Battleshock and surviving, and not just being wiped out wholesale to have any effect at all. You can put out a bit of extra objective control with duty and honour, or maybe do fixed bayonets if for some reason that makes most sense, but I feel like in general he just tends to be maybe a bit extra, Maybe you could have one of them in the heart of a guard formation if you were going loads of infantry perhaps. Or maybe just as he's literally a 30 point unit, you could just weirdly use him for actions in strategic reserves. But obviously that's not really going with his intended purpose whatsoever. I've chosen to give him a 2 out of 5 for in-game power. I'll give him the full 3 out of 3 for the lore and feel though. Utterly iconic for the guard and keeping the men more fearful of retreating with the wrath of this guy. As opposed to anything that the horrendous Xenos and Chaos can do to them. If you will not serve me, then you will serve on the firing line. Orthbex, I am going to have to disagree hard with you on that 2 out of 5. Sure, it may not feel right, but in-game usefulness, the Commissar being the cheapest way of us getting a cheeky strategic reserve, backfield, objective doer, action doer, is great. So I'm going to give him a 4 out of 5 on that. Yeah, the whole summary execution thing isn't as useful, and I don't think I've ever seen political Overwatch ever come into effect. But just because he is the cheapest way that we can get an objective control one unit that can do actions in the guard army, he's he is actually very very useful for me. Um, and rule of cool though, I'm totally in alignment. The commissar is possibly the most iconic unit in the guard addition in addition out they are synonymous with our faction they are grim dark they are 40k they are imperial guard so three out of three on that one the next unit that we're going to look at is ogrins i love ogrins they have a special place in my heart i don't know what it is about the unit i've always preferred them over their cousins the bulgrin and you know what? I think Ogrins are actually kind of useful now. They're not just cool. The ability to spam out so many pseudo heavy bolter shots from those Ripper guns, because these ones have got rapid fire three, is really good. And the fact that with point blank barrage, you can get extra AP, which gets round their just natural AP of one, means they can stack on a lot of wounds. Sure, they've only got a blitz skill of four plus, but between just volume or having a Lord Solar hanging around, you can actually get them to deliver a really deadly volley. So I'm going to give the Ogrins a... I'm going to give them a 4 out of 5. I, I know that's controversial and some people are going to really not agree with that, but between the ability for big squads to really lay down the hammer and 
between that and the fact you can put them in the back of chimeras the chimeras now can get lethal hits the firing deck will give the ogres lethal hits you can stack on a lot of damage there and a bit like with strachan just having a pinch of cheap close combat in your army can do wonders can really unlock a few opportunities i'm sort of waving through a 3.5 and a 4 but i'm going to stick to my guns and go with a 4 out of 5 here rule of cool they are one of my favorite units in the guard I think they're very lovable. I've loved them since Dawn of War. So I'm going to give them, I'm going to do 2.5 out of 3 on that front. Well, the Ogrims, I have just been a little bit less generous than you there. I've chosen to give them a 3 out of 5 there. I do genuinely think that their damage output is very good if they can get close enough to deliver it. They just really absolutely need to be within that 9 inch range to actually do anything much though. Both getting the extra AP and double the shots, both hinging on being there, just means that they're kind of a bit all or nothing. And they aren't super fast unless they're being transported around with some extra points and things. For their cheap cost though, I do think that they're very usable. Just maybe not desperately stand out for me. I would be a bit more tempted by the higher investment Borgrins out of the two of them. Though I feel like they're a fun unit. I've chosen to give them a 2 for law. Nice to have some space ogres running around with ripper guns, clobbing the enemy into the ground. Speaking of which, next up we have the Borgrin squad. These guys seem to have really done well out of 10th edition. Massively tanky with their 4 plus invulnerable saves, minus 1 damage with wall of muscle, and a 6 plus feel no pain on top of that. It just means that you can have small squads of these just survive really well on midfield objectives, and having a bunch of strength 7 and damage 2 attacks is really quite nice to counter charge things that think that they can rush up and try and take down the guard army in combat. They're just quite a nice unit that can make a lot of damage go away, particularly high AP things with those invulnerable saves. I often find that I lose more wounds of them due to small arms as opposed to big anti-tank type guns. And they're kind of the exact sort of thing that you want on the front line, maybe one weakness being slightly less OC than some. They work well with Lord Solar as well, being able to boost their movement is really quite a powerful one to get charges off or get to objectives that the opponent might not necessarily expect. Overall for gameplay, I have been maybe a bit generous with them. I've given them the 4, 5 out of 5 despite the points increase. They still seem to be getting played quite a bit in some top tournament performing lists. Even if they aren't quite as standout, ridiculously amazing as they were prior to the points increase. The rule of call, I've given them a 1.5 out of the 3. I still think they're fun, sort of cybernetically augmented space ogres. Their theming just maybe feels just a little bit more contrived than the standard ogrins though, which feel a bit more integral to the guard and easy to understand for me. Now I know that my stance on Bulgrins and Ogren squads is a little controversial, but there's just something about these Bulgrins that just doesn't click with me. I think it's, especially with the points costs that's gone up recently for them, I'm just not feeling them anymore. I know a lot of competitive players swear by these guys and I have used them myself and found them to be very useful, but I always find there's something else I want in my list instead of these guys. So I'm going to give them a 3.5 out of 5 on the usefulness. I, that's a very calculated score. I think like a 3 feels a bit middle and these are definitely better than middle, but I have found plenty of ways when using my guard to play around like not having Bolgren and I found that I've I don't know, there's other things that are a bit tankier. Yeah, they get a 3.5 out of 5, but I would definitely admit that's a bit of personal bias on my end. In terms of um, rule of cool, it, I'm going to go with you on this one. I think they're a 1.5. They're, they're okay, but there's just something about them that isn't quite as cool, quite as badass, quite as lovable as the humble traditional Ogren. Now, my stance on Ogrins and Bulgrins might be a bit far out, but I think a lot of people are going to agree with me on my stance with Rattlings. They're a bit rubbish, aren't they? Oh, no. Do you, you have people say, oh, you could use them for infiltrators. They're great for stopping scouts and everything. Ah, they just very, don't really do a very good job, unfortunately. T2 means that they get picked up by a fart in the breeze and... Their damage output leaves something to be desired. I think if sniper rifles, if precision in general, could pick out like special weapons and stuff like that, that'd be really, really good. But the fact that they can only go after characters and their damage against characters is okay, but precision is a bit rubbish in shooting in 10th. Really precision in combat is what you want. These guys have got no durability. Their infiltrating potential is theory craft rather than uh, translation on the tabletop. They just... I've never found a reason to include them in my army. 
I'm going to have to give them a one out of five on usefulness. I'm sure some people will argue against that. But for me, I'm just not feeling the rattlings at all on the usefulness front. On the rule of cool, though, they are an iconic guard unit. And they're something that we've had in our army for a long time. And I actually really like the models. I think the, the current models that they've got are actually pretty badass. So I'm going to give them a two out of three on the cool front. Yeah, for me, I probably am going to disagree a little bit on the rattlings there. I've chosen to give them a three out of five for gameplay. Not really because they even are an absolutely amazing infiltrator unit or anything like that. Just literally because they're one of the only options that guard can get for that. Pretty handy for doing secondary objectives turn one. Making sure that scout moving cast chans can move up into the mid board. And potentially keeping back enemy scout moves like say world eaters that might have a ridiculous amount of things running at you. I do fully agree though that the toughness to and poor save just makes them absolutely abysmal if they do ever get exposed and they will die quite quickly so they're definitely paying a big premium for literally just being a unit in the midboard. I certainly wouldn't take more than one squad myself. Occasionally their sniper fire might do something useful though I feel like that's a bonus if that happens at all. I'd just literally be more using them more for placeholder sort of models jumping in and out of cover doing a little bit of firepower and maybe threatening objectives and things. I've certainly had them pull their way to my list. I still wouldn't say they're standout though for those reasons. For all of cool, I think they're fun. I've also chosen to give them a 2 out of 3 there. I personally wouldn't mind seeing some updated miniatures for them. I think that their current ones are still in metal if I remember rightly. They've definitely got the fun factor though. Moving on and we've got the Attilan Rough Riders. Got to love a little bit of guard cavalry in space. Taking standard horses and charging down the enemy with extreme prejudice. At the current points cost, I think that Attila and Rough Riders are genuinely a great unit. I've certainly enjoyed putting mine back on the table. Now they're so cheap again once more, that they did take a bit of a knock from no longer being able to reinforcement quite as easily. They move nice and fast at 12 inches. Their durability isn't awful at 2 wounds at a 4 plus save, even if most things can damage them really quite well. But they do absolutely bring enough melee damage for the points. Those hunting lances with the melter hits and plus 1 to wound can take down some surprising stuff. And their threat range can be absolutely enormous with move, move, move on the go. Overall, I've chosen to give these guys a 4.5 out of 5 on the gameplay front. I think they're genuinely absolutely great for being a counter charge threat and playing a bit cagey behind cover and then punishing something that thinks that they can advance and engage a guard army at close range. And could be an interesting sort of unit for the options of reinforcements or maybe rapid ingress as well. Could be seriously spooky to have a unit of these turn up on the flanks with how fast they can move. For rule of call, I've given them a 2 out of 3. I do really like the Guard Cavalry, though I must admit, for me personally, I was a little bit more mixed than I expected to be on the actual miniatures. They certainly went down the Attilan theme fairly heavily, rather than more general purpose Guard. I personally am a little bit more of a fan of the Death Corps Riders for that. Seems like Auspex and I have been disagreeing on a few units recently, but you know what? I'm in perfect alignment with him on Rough Riders. The only reason you don't see me using them in my list is because I have not got them built and painted up yet, but I assure you they are coming. Great movement, decent durability, the ability to do a good counter charge. Those melter lances are surprisingly good, especially with the fact that they have the lance rule. So it kind of gets around the whole strength nine thing. And also being able to be good at screening and to get on objectives early. They're an incredibly flexible unit. And they're now sort of in the similar points cost to a lot of the infantry squads. So how I like to look at these guys is a unit of five Rough Riders is the same as taking a like 10-man unit of Katachans. And they can do a lot of similar roles to that. Uh, or they can sprinkle a little bit of that close combat, that good counter-attacking that you need. And especially with factions like World Eaters that seem to be on the rise at the time of recording. And combat in general seems to be on the rise a little bit. Uh, having something that can counter-charge, Barney in close combat, definitely a good unit to have. Rule of cool. The actual models, I agree with all specs on this, that they're okay, they're fine, but the best Rough Riders I've ever seen are ones that I've had a bit of a head swap, a bit of a conversion done. So I'm going to give them a 2.3 out of, uh, 2 out of 3, I should say. If you see a good converted one, they can be a 3 out of 3, but the standard model is like a 1 out of 3 for me. So on average, a 2 out of 3. Then we have the Scout Sentinels. Easily a 5 out of 5 unit, easily a 3 out of 3 unit. They are both a very iconic unit for the Guard. They're very cool. Uh, they're one of those units that the Guard have had for a long time as well. And they've recently had a range refresh. At first, a lot of people were like, ah, not my sense though. I'm going to stick to the old ones. But now that we've actually seen the new ones in person, they, they are just a clear upgrade. And they're just a fantastic, cool looking model. In terms of their usefulness, 
what can't they do they scout nine inches they've got a 10 inch move on top of that great for doing early objectives great for screening out t7 with a three percent over seven wounds makes them surprisingly durable and they're a fantastic go-to choice for reinforcement stratagems now that your other infantry choices aren't quite as appealing their anti-tank capability is awesome. I pretty much always go for triple LAS cannon on these things. I've tried auto cannons and plasma cannons, but I just keep coming back to that big LAS cannon. And the number one thing about them is they get lethals all the time. Thanks to the newborn soldiers and these guys having both the regiment and squadron keyword, they are just hitting hard, hitting fast every single game. These are just an easy S tier unit in the guard for me right now. Well, agreement on the gameplay for this one and not too much to add from me. They just work well on every level. A cheap unit to skirmish on objectives with Scout. A really good synergy buffing rule with the reroll hit rolls of 1, which is pretty nice to have on such a cheap unit. Good durability and acceptable enough damage output. I feel like plasma cannons got a lot more interesting when they got lethal hits, though I too still probably prefer the last cannon out of everything. Easy 5 out of 5 for me for the gameplay. I've chosen to give them a 2.5 out of 5 for the lore and feel of them. They are a pretty iconic guard model that's been around since the early days of the guard. A nice blend of 40k weirdness and sort of more traditional soldiering. Next up though we have their more armoured cousins getting a 2 plus save and losing the scout move. And they get to reroll wound rolls against monsters and vehicles. Armoured sentinels also really liked the changes in the latest balance data slate. They get their lethal hits on the move and they are also the single unit that can recycle the most points with reinforcements now. Maybe more important when you only have one use of it. Though I must admit for me personally I'm still on team scout sentinel out of the two. I prefer the scout move, the extra movement characteristic and particularly the reroll ones debuff rule. I feel like I can trade out a bit of durability and a bit of hitting power for that personally. For that reason I've chosen to give them a 4 out of 5 for me. I know they are very popular. I tend to go with individual scout sentinels and then backing up some more fearsome tanks. The armoured sentinel damage output still isn't awesome, even if they are just spectacularly durable. Once again, I find myself in agreement with Comrade Orspex. I think armoured sentinels are better, but I don't think that I am moving over from team scout sentinel. The big issue I have with armoured sentinels is they cost more than Lehman Russ, or they're similar ballpark to some of the more premium Lehman Russes. And if I'm going to take a big damage dealing unit, I feel like I'm going to go down Lehman Russ. Whereas the Scout Sentinels do other things and are a bit of a force multiplier. They're a decent unit, and I definitely think there is some potential to spam Sentinels. Maybe go in two squads of three Scouts, two squads of three Armoured, using infantry orders to order them around because they don't need tank orders. There's some potential there, but right now I'm still feeling like the Scout Sentinels are better. And so I'm just going to agree with Auspex's score on this unit, both for the usefulness and for the rule of cool. Now, our next unit is one that I have completely changed my opinion on recently. The Hellhound is a really good unit. At the start of 10th edition and in previous editions as well, I just I thought they were a cool tank, but I never really found them to do very much on the battlefield for me. But I've been taking three of them in a few of my lists, and they have been doing work. What I really like about the Hellhound is going with the classic loadout, going with that Inferno Cannon and that Heavy Flamer on the front. Being able to just spam out so many auto-hitting attacks just allows them to stack up a surprising amount of damage. And one thing that I completely overlooked at the beginning of the edition is that Inferno Cannon is AP-2. I just assumed it was AP-1, but it's AP-2. And that allows it to kick a lot of units down onto their 4 and vulnerable saves if they have one. And it also allows it to get a lot of vehicles, which it typically will be winning on 5s, thanks to having Strength 6, puts them down onto a 5-up save. The big thing I like about the Hellhound is the flush them out ability, because what it does is, after you finish shooting an enemy unit, that unit cannot bet benefit from cover anymore it's really good for taking those units which in, the, in your army which only have like ap minus one and suddenly making that ap feel impactful you can stack it up with things like exterminators and fields of fire to really just make a lot of your army feel a lot more powerful they're a good force multiplier is what i'm trying to say combine that with the 
Weirdly good durability. They've got a two-up save. You would think all those fuel tanks would mean they'd have a slightly less good save, but hey, they've got a two-up save now. And I think they're a great way of spamming a cheap, durable unit that can punch well above its weight and can be a good force multiplier. So I am going to give these a 4.5 out of 5 on the usefulness front. Uh, if you'd asked me a month ago, I probably would have given them a 3 at best, but I've been having really good success with them. And on the rule of cool, I'm going to give them... I'm going to give them a 2.5. I have a real soft spot for those iconic classic guard units. And the Hellhound's been around for a long time. So I think it's earned that 2.5. Looks like I've been a little bit more wary of the Hellhounds than Mordian, giving them a 3.5 out of 5 for me. I really am in a little bit too minds about them. They are genuinely a very good unit, I think. The ignores cover, the good AP flamethrowers, and the 2 plus save are all really nice. I'm still probably a little bit more tempted by, as we talked about earlier, the Flamer cast chans in a Chimera with twin heavy flamers for that same sort of role. Still able to fry a whole bunch of infantry and then just have the annoyance factor of loads of high objective control things jumping out of it to take objectives after you're done. For me, I feel like that's worth the extra 10 points that that costs over the 115 for the Hellhound. But certainly since the points drop, I feel like these are so much better now. I think I'd be weighing them up between a 3.5 and a 4 for me personally. I would certainly take the Inferno Cannon as well. One of the big advantages of the Hellhound is that you can get far better Overwatch with it, as you can't Overwatch with things inside the Chimera with Firing Deck. For rule of cool, I have given these the full 3 out of 3. Fun scary flame tanks to burn away the enemy, the chance to blow up with a really big explosion, and weirdly one of the guard units that I've got a pretty excessive amount of myself. I've got 6 of these things converted up. That was from the days when you could run them in squadrons. Next up we have perhaps one of the single most intimidating guard units to play against right now, getting a ridiculous glow up in the balanced data slate. I have given the Rogue Ordorn Battle Tank a full 5 out of 5 for gameplay. At 240 points it just feels kind of hard to go wrong with these right now. Toughness 12 and 18 wounds with a 2 plus save is great durability, and the ability to blank out a damage result just before you roll the save is great, particularly if it's a very high AP weapon. Then you've just got a whole tank that's a cluster of scary guns, a big oppressor cannon, maybe a pulverizer cannon, some melter sponsons and stubbers and things. All of that getting lethal hits on vehicles all of a sudden was a massive deal. Really good that they don't have to compromise between choosing to move and gain that anymore. They're a good focal choice for synergy buffs like orders, tech priest 4 plus invulnerable saves, and things like smoke or minus 1 damage. You can easily justify all of these, provided there's enough room to move them about on the tabletop. I feel like you're going to struggle to go too far wrong. For rule of cool, I've given them a 2 out of 3 on that. I do really like the look and feel of the tank. I really enjoyed building it up. Plus there's a handy hole in the bottom so you can store all the spare bits. A lot of people's opinions on that one might be divided though. I say they maybe don't have quite the same sort of place in the guard as the trusty Lehman Ross though for an iconic battle tank. So before the recent points changes, I had already done a few videos speculating about how I thought the Rogal Dawn was a very good unit. And I think how it's being slept on a bit by the community since the points change, I think it has come really to the fore and it is an undisputably good vehicle now, a phenomenally durable one. In my own experience, I have only ever lost a Rogal Dawn in one turn once, but I've never lost a Rogal Dawn in any single phase. The one time that I lost one in one turn is when my I did a bad screening and my opponent was able to shoot and charge it. But if you're able to get some good screening up there, it's just between the smoke you can pop on them, the four vulnerable save you can get on them, the ablated plating, it can just absorb an entire turn's worth of firepower and come through the other side. It might be badly damaged, but it'll come through the other side. And that level of tankiness combined with the firepower that has been augmented by all the lethal hits. Yeah, I have to agree with all specs of this one. This is now an easy five out of five unit. You can spam three of them for 720 points. That is awesome. On the rule of cool, big car tanks always get a good score from me more tanks are always better so i'm going to give it a two out of three that's a solid rule of cool score from the heady heights of the rogal dawn to the terrible lows of the heavy weapons squad these guys have not done well out of the recent update Heavy weapon squads in general have always been a very fragile unit, which has limited the usefulness of a lot of their weapons, like autocannons and heavy bolters. But they had one ace up their sleeve, the Humble Mortar. They were very cheap, very spammable, and you could take three of these squads, giving you nine mortars, and they could just stack on lethal hits. 
but they can't do that anymore with the change to born soldiers and that has completely chopped the legs out from underneath them and what i would have given a good score to previously i'm now gonna have to say they are a one out of five unit they don't really have any remaining usefulness in them rule of cool they're fine they're just like a guard squad at the end of the day so they can have a 1.5 out of three yeah, unfortunately, Games Workshop really haven't done too much to help out the heavy weapon squad. I feel like they possibly could just give them some slightly arbitrarily inflated stats, maybe a slightly better save to represent some sandbags or something. It's just always been a bit sad that if you put them within line of sight at all to use those fun heavy weapons, they're going to get deleted by absolutely anything that shoots at them. I've chosen to give them a 2 out of 5 for their indirect support. The mortars still do efficient damage to enemy light infantry. And I believe that two squads of them still outshoot the Wyvern into the same sort of one wound targets. Can be handy just to take out a backfield objective holder unit. And then the opponent's got some annoying problems for whether or not they keep some valuable stuff back to take that point. Losing lethal hits was definitely a blow though. For all of cool, I've given them a 2 out of 3 for me. Standard Guardsman bringing the heavy weapons to the fight. Quite an iconic unit. Next up, we've got the Field Ordnance Batteries. Basically a heavy weapon team on steroids. These are a little bit tougher with 6 wounds and a 4 plus save. But still not really to the point where you'd want to have them exposed for the most part. They do die easier than tanks do. They're actually a unit that maybe hasn't done too badly out of the latest artillery type changes. They tended to be hitting on a 4 plus anyway. So that hit restriction hasn't hurt them as much. Even if the lethal hit was still a big deal for them. I've chosen to give them a 2.5 overall. I still say that probably the indirect is the way to go for them, even if the last cannons are kind of fun. I think if you want direct anti-tank damage, you're just probably best off having it on some sort of armoured vehicle. For example, a squad of two of these isn't so much less than a Vanquisher tank, which comes with a lot more durability and able to move a lot faster, whereas these basically just have to sit in place with the 4 plus movement. For all of cool, I do quite like the miniatures, a nice crude artillery base. I've given them a 2 out of 3 for that. So I'm going to be a little bit more generous to the field ordnance battery than all specs. And I do agree that the direct fire options are kind of rubbish. The heavy last cannon, the Myers rocket launcher. Yeah, they're just going to die if you expose my heavy weapon squads. But the Bombast field gun is definitely the best option. And I like the fact that you can benefit from sustained hits with this. So yeah, it's not getting lethal hits, but it's getting something, right? And for me, I'm going to give them that little pip in usefulness. I'm going to give them a 3 out of 5, maybe even a 3.5 out of 5. And the big reason I'm going to give them that is their model availability. For the longest time, basilisks have been very hard to get your hands on. And those basilisks are probably the go-to uh, indirect fire for guard right now. But for a lot of newer players, their go-to source of indirect fire, the one they can actually get their hands on, is going to be the field orders battery with Bombast Field Gun. And so because of that actual availability, I'm going to give them that 3.5 out of 5. They're not the most powerful artillery, but you can actually get them. In terms of rule of cool, I think the guard roster was missing that fixed artillery for a while. We had a lot of self-propelled stuff, but the fobs with those Bombast cannons sort of it fixed a little gap in the guard roster, so I'm going to go for a 2 out of 3 on that front. Now we get to the most iconic guard tank. One of the most iconic tanks in all of Warhammer 40k, the venerable Lehman Russ. Beloved by a lot in the guard community. Just looking at the Russ's stat line and the extra weapons that the sponsors you can put on it, I think this is just an easy four out of five i could even say it's a five out of five but that will depend on the different variants but on its base stat line and with the extra weapons it can get i think the rust brings a very affordable durable hull which is chock full of firepower rule of cool it has to be a three out of three the like i said it's an iconic unit yeah, full agreement for me on those scores. I've also chosen to give the Lehman Ross a 4 out of 5. It does definitely depend on the variants, but to me it's basically kind of one data sheet that just gets different data sheets, special rules, and different turrets, so it almost feels like more like a war gear selection to me. I might have been tempted to push out to a 4.5 for the better variants if I was feeling a bit more generous. Again, an easy 3 for the theme and rule of cool type thing. It's pretty much as iconic for the guard as he can possibly get, crushing the enemy with big armour, tracks, and heavy firepower. Now let's look at the different variants in closer detail, starting with the El Clasico. This, I think, is one of the best Rust variants. 
with Pariah Nexus and with the changes to how Guard get lethal hits. This is because of the Armored Spearhead ability giving you full rerolls to hit when you shoot a Lemurus Battle Tank at an enemy unit on an objective you don't control. Now, this ability applies to all the guns, not just the main one. So there is a huge amount of lethal hits that you could potentially get out of this tank. After this, we have the Demolisher. Very, very cool looking vehicle with that big stubby cannon. And the Line Breaker ability does mean you can kind of be a bit more ballsy with this because it can shoot with no problems whilst it's locked up in combat. The reason why I tend to shy away from the Demolisher these days is because you can get that demolisher cannon on the tank commander and the demolisher the base demolisher itself is a little bit pricey so i tend to go for tank command demolishers and i leave the reg demolishers at home then we have my new favorite russ the vanquisher on paper this thing looks like a liability but that Vanquisher Cannon can put out a horrendous amount of damage. Great strength, great AP, D6 plus 6 damage. Just the threat of it, I have found, has caused opponents to change their deployment. And I have been taking three of these things in my tournament lists, and they have been doing phenomenally well. A very, very cheap variant with the potential for great damage spikes. On the other end of the spectrum, we have the Lemurus Punisher, a very, very cool vehicle putting out by the Orcs definition enough DACA. But in terms of its usefulness, I think this is one that I tend to leave on the shelves. We're in a more mechanized and vehicle heavy meta, and this thing is good at killing infantry. And it doesn't generate enough lethal hits for it to be worth it. If you want to generate lethal hits, you're going to go for the battle tank, as we said. In a similar vein, we've got the Executioner. Now, the change to Lethal Hits has definitely helped fix one of its problems, which is it sort of caps out at Strength 8, and it can have really good AP and damage as well. The issue I have with the Executioner is its ability. The enemy unit has to already be pretty much dead before it kicks in, and at that point, I feel like what you might end up doing is just overkilling the enemy unit. And I know there's no kill like overkill, but it does feel like the execution ability makes it slightly less efficient. Next up, we have the Exterminator. I like this vehicle. I think it's had a big glow up in 10th edition, and it's only got better with the recent changes to lethal hits. The Exterminator Autocannon fires four shots, strength nine, AP minus one, damage three, but it also has rapid fire four and twin linked. So when you get it within 24 inch range, which is relatively easy to do on the smaller balls of 10th edition, you're getting those eight shots. That's the potential for lethal hits. And then anything that doesn't lethal hit, you've got the twin linked to get those wounds through anyway. The only weakness it really has is AP minus one, but between Hellhounds and Creed, you can really boost this AP. The best thing about the Exterminator though is the Withering Hail ability. It's a phenomenal force multiplier. It can give lots of extra vehicles, extra units, uh, additional AP, and more AP is always a good thing. It just allows you to stack more wounds on the enemy, just get that damage through. Last but certainly not least, we have the Lehman Rust Eradicator. This is a bit of a funny Rust variant because it gets a surprisingly high number of attacks. Most blast weapons in the guard are D6 plus 3 shots, and this is D3 plus 6. Now, its strength and AP have traditionally left something to be desired, but that's not such a big problem with the lethal hits situation with newborn soldiers. And the AP mass 1, again, isn't too bad because this Eradicator Nova Cannon in built ignores cover. For me, the Eradicator is a unit that I'm keeping an eye on at the moment. From a theory point of view, it should have a lot more usability, but I just haven't had the chance to test it yet. But it's definitely one on the up and up. Not too much to add for me for those ones. I'll just rattle through them a little bit quickly. I certainly like the Lehman Ross Battle Tank better with its objective focus. Though I feel like that AP1 is kind of painful. There's certainly a few ways that you can help it out though with Fields of Fire, Executioners, or Ignore Cover. I'd fully agree on the Demolisher. Nice gun, but I'd rather have it on the Tank Commander for the Order and the Fires on Death, personally. The Vanquish is just so cheap, and a massive all-or-nothing gun really isn't the worst in the world. I'm still maybe a little bit more mid on them than Mordian, I think. Just because some games they might do absolutely amazing and other games they might do a whole load of missing. And relying on a 4+, plus or your opponent not command rolling a successful and vulnerable save can be a bit painful. 
The anti-infantry variants in the Punisher and the Eradicator, I just feel like they're not the choice for the Lehman Ross chassis, unfortunately. Really cool guns, particularly with the Gatling cannon, but as Mordian said, there's just so many different ways in which you can destroy infantry with a guard. Generally, I'd rely on the big tanks to be destroying with the enemy heavy hitters and not whittling out the rank and file. The exterminators, really nice synergy. Again, kind of let down a little bit by the low AP and sort of needing to be fairly close to be in particularly effective range. Really good to be able to fling an extra AP minus one against the thing that matters the most though. Really good if you're trying to bring down something tough with a two plus save and armor of contempt. And finally, I do think that the execution has got a lot better in Pariah Nexus with the lethal hits. Excellent elite infantry killing with the good AP, the best out of the best tanks besides the Vanquisher and Demolisher. But getting lethal hits just massively amps up its efficiency against tough stuff and makes it far more of a consideration there. As mentioned though, its special rule is just kind of bad really. Below half strength targets are going to be a minority of things that you're going to be firing against. So that is a bit of a letdown compared with most of the other Ross variants. Overall though, I do quite like the way that there's genuinely plenty of them that you could actually consider in an army list. Being able to adjust the points has meant that Games Workshop's made more of them at least worthy of consideration than they might have been before. Moving on though, and next up we have the Mighty Basilisk. Solid guard artillery with strength 8, AP 2 and damage 2. Certainly taking some heavy knocks in the balanced data slate unfortunately, meaning that you're always going to be hitting on force. And certainly a far cry from the sheer accuracy it could have before between sentinels and orders hitting on a 2 plus re-rolling ones. Losing lethal hits was a big deal for making it less general purpose as well with that mid strength 8. For Basilisk though, I still think that they're a pretty excellent utility piece. They did go down in points just a little bit, and even if their targets of choice are going to be a lot more focused, they still have that very nasty minus two to move, advance, and charge debuff. Certainly possible to keep entire enemy units out of the game with that against the right army, and still good enough damage to stack a lot of wounds on things like enemy space marines and give your opponent problems with units that they can hold the backfield with perhaps. Overall, I've chosen to give them a 4 out of 5. At least you don't have to waste points or effort supporting them as much anymore. As a rule of call, cool, I'll be maybe a bit generous and give them the full 3 out of 3. There's something just pretty awesome about having a massive howitzer type cannon that's got enough range on paper to fire far onto the next table. Classic Mordian Glory hot take incoming. I'm going to give the Basilisk a 5 out of 5 on usefulness. Yeah, it's not as accurate. Yeah, it's not going to leave the hits anymore but that Earthshaker round ability is game winning. That's not theory craft. I've been to multiple tournaments recently where I have taken my Basilisk and they have single-handedly won me games. Being able to slow your opponent down and be able to target those little five man units that they really want to just sneak onto objectives whilst they bamboozle you with the big stuff is awesome. Minus two to move, minus two to the advance roll and the charge roll you could just have terminators crawling across the board. So on rapid ingress is you with unit terminators, pss, drop a basic on them. You've still got a nine inch charge, mate. Really, really good unit. And I'm going to give it a three out of three on the rule of cool because it is one of the iconic units and it has some of the best voice lines from the old Dawn of War games as well. After the basilisk, we have the Hydra. It's cheap. And that's about it. The Hydra is basically a Chimera, which someone decided to strap four auto cannons onto, and that's okay. And yeah, it's anti-fly 2 plus, and yeah, it's twin linked, and there's a lot going for it, and it's 85 points. The problem I have with the Hydra is its volume of fire is kind of low. If this thing was like the Exterminator, it had rapid fire as well, oh baby, 100%, I would include it. The problem I have with the Hydra is you sort of throw a couple of them in your list and you realize, hang on, I've only got so many tank orders to go around. Most guard armies are going to be rocking between three and five tank orders. And you tend to find that you've got more than enough points to put other things in your army that are genuinely heavy hitting, like Lehman Russes, Rogal Dawns. And the Hydra is something you can chuck in your list, but if you take too many of them, they either soak up your tank orders from other more useful areas, or they don't get a tank order, at which point they're hitting on fours and their volume of fire just leaves a lot to be desired. So I'm going to give them a 2.5 on usefulness because they're not great, they're not terrible, they're just bang down the middle. And on rule of cool, they're pretty iconic guard units, so I'll give them the 2 out of 3. Similar sort of takes for me here. I chose to give them a 3 out of 5 for in-game use. Fully agree with those takes, really. 
85 points is nice and cheap to get an extra armoured hull on the board, though they just really don't do much. I feel like they have to be pointing out a fly units before they get in any way efficient, and even then they might sort of let you down. Say for example if the fly units got a good save, there's pretty much good chance that they're saving on a very high value anyway against that AP1 attacks, and only getting 4 shots means you might not even be triggering all that many saves. Also as mentioned, a bit inefficient for orders. Again for rule of cool, a standard guard vehicle. I do quite like the look of the whole quad auto cannon thing, I've chosen to give them a 2 out of 5 there. These guys are definitely a bit of a shadow of their former selves in previous editions, you could certainly glance a lot of vehicles to death with them in the past. Next up we've got the enormous Storm Eagle rockets of the Manticore, a little bit less pricey than it was prior to the update at 175 points now. And this thing is basically a premium artillery choice for if you want some very savage hitting indirect fire. These is plus one shots at strength 10, AP 2, damage 3 with blast and heavy. And if you target some bigger squads of elite infantry perhaps, then if they've got five or more models in the unit then you can re-roll the hit roll. If you just want general purpose artillery damage then this thing I still think is a pretty solid unit even in face of the nerfs. Again like the basilisk, it just means that you don't waste time, effort or points on actually supporting this and it just sits and does its thing. I feel like it can still be at least fairly accurate given that re-roll rule, at least against the right targets. I've chosen to give it a 4 out of 5 overall, just literally because a little bit of indirect fire that can reliably do some scary damage against something can be absolutely game changing. Destroying the last of an enemy unit or just putting a bit of damage on the thing that your opponent really wants to keep safe to deal damage in their own right. Having one or two of these in the backfield can certainly put your opponent under pressure. I still think that they're viable enough, even if I think they're a little bit worse than they were before when you could get them to hit on twos re-rolling. For all of call cool, again, I've chosen to give them a sort of middle of the road 2 out of 3, a fun missile tank that makes some big blasts. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. The Manticore, what could have been argued to be the premier artillery in the entire 40k 10th edition, now I think super mid. I'm going to give it at best a 2.5 out of 5. And I know some people are going to disagree with that strongly. You know, and I know that might be people saying, oh, boy, you just say these controversial takes. But honestly, my re problem with the Manticore is it doesn't have lethal hits anymore. And it's so goddamn swingy. You've got, you know, D6 plus one shots. Sometimes you get six shots, seven shots. Sometimes you get two. And at least before when it had decent lethal hits, that if you got a bad roll, you might still get a, you know, pop a couple of sixes, you might be all right. But now it hasn't even got that going for it. And it's the most expensive one. And it's not a force multiplier. For me, it just doesn't find a way into my lists. And if I'm going to take artillery, I'm going to put a couple of bathers in there over the manticore any day of the week. Rule of call, though, it's big. Big boomy rockets, right? Let's go for a two out of three. But at least the Manticore isn't the worst artillery in the guard. That dubious honor goes to the Wyvern. This thing is frankly awful. If you put this in your list, you are actively downgrading your army. Its gun is super swingy. It's got no AP. Oh, it ignores cover. I don't care. It has no AP. It doesn't matter. Twin linked on strength five, whatever. It's a good at killing infantry. As we said, guard has plenty of ways of killing infantry. It's a zero out of five. And if anyone in the comment section says, fix an LVO, I am going to be vexed. Terribly vexed. That was an outlier result. I swear to God. On terms of rule of call, it's also my least favorite artillery piece. I think it looks kind of derpy. Also, hashtag justice for the Griffin. So I'm going to give it a zero out of three on that. The Worst possible score it can have, I'm going to give it. Seems to have not been quite as harsh as Mordian there. I still wouldn't really rate this one as very good. I still feel like having a little bit of indirect firepower can be massively impactful and disruptive to your opponent. And even if this thing just spends a turn or two clearing out a one wound backfield objective holder to disrupt their plans and stop them scoring points and things, then that does have value. I think for artillery pieces though, I would just want to go with something that's a little bit more general purpose. This thing just isn't really going to do very much at all to anything that isn't just one wound infantry with poorish saves, and that's probably not general purpose enough to get the nod versus the competition. It's minus one to hit thing, it's kind of fun, but I feel like if you're just using the Wyvern to hand that out, then you're probably not getting enough value out of the points that you've spent on it. Overall, I've given it a 1.5 out of 5 on the gameplay, and also I've given it a 1.5 out of 3 on the sort of rule of cool type thing. I feel like the Wyvern's mainly being sold by the gameplay more so than the looks of the model. 
I do remember when these things used to be absolutely savage in like 6th and 7th edition though with all of those crazy spore blast sniping things. On to the biggest and baddest missile in the codex though and next up we have the death strike. I feel like they had this thing in kind of an interesting place in 9th edition but really hit it hard for 10th. That plasma warhead that it has basically zeroes in on a target ideally makes the enemy try and run for the hills to try and get away from it, and if they don't get away fast enough, then he hits them with a whole bunch of strength 16 AP4 damage 1 hits. Unfortunately though, I feel like for the way that it's costed, and the amount of damage that it stacks, there's just a bit too much of a danger of the opponent just sitting there and accepting the damage on one of their units. He could just have an unreliable chance to maybe kill something like one Terminator, or maybe two or three Space Marines, unless he can affect lots of units at the same time, then it just winds up not really being worth it. And you've got the difficult decision as to whether or not to redeclare the target or just fire off and get a little bit of damage. I feel like it basically just needs to be either a bit cheaper or have its damage output boosted to the extent where it's going to be seriously threatening to wipe out entire units at the current points cost. I just don't think it's good enough, unfortunately. For that reason, I've chosen just to give it a 1 out of 5. I guess it could be disruptive to help move around enemy castles. But overall, I think that you're going to be better off with just about any of the other artillery pieces to give you a bit more reliable damage stacked on one target that the enemy can't just move to avoid. For rule of call though, I have given it the full 3 out of 3. Hard not to love just the sheer bonkers element of carrying an entire cruise missile into the game. I'm going to sum up my thoughts on the Death Strike missile with a quote from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. 10 out of 10 for style, minus several million for good thinking. However, moving on from what might be one of the worst units in the index to what I think is the current best unit we have, the Humble Chimera APC. Cheap as chips, durable as all hell, and with a generous carrying capacity and a decent firing deck, this thing can roll around, spitting out DACA left, right, and center, deliver high value OC targets onto objectives, and is Durable enough that it can take a bit of a beating and do a good job at screening. You can make it into a pseudo hellhound. You can have it as a DACA tank. It does a little bit of everything. I'm going to give the Chimera the full 5 out of 5 on usefulness. I have been having very, very good success with these in the tournament scene. And I'm going to give it the full 3 out of 3 on Rule of Cool because it is just the Imperial Guard transport. Yeah, full agreement from me there. Chimera is absolutely awesome right now. I chose to give them a 4 out of 5, just a little bit off the full 5. I feel like maybe you can just get into a little bit of diminishing returns after you've got a few of them. So I think they're absolutely excellent for a few squads moving forward and just being an annoying unit to deal with on objectives. For quite how cheap the transport is, it's absolutely savage in terms of anti-light infantry sort of damage. A couple of heavy flamers, a heavy stubber and all of those last gun arrays potentially even doing a bit of chip damage to tougher things now that it gets lethal hits against vehicles. I'm pretty reasonable to include with a whole bunch of units. I think as before, probably my favourite is still the scouting cast chans with the flamers. Gives you some really nice options to either keep embarked and fire some flamers out the roof of it for basically four flamer attacks up close to burn enemy infantry down, or have them get out to be a little bit further up the board and take those points. Nice and cheap and expendable. I think I'd usually just go with the route of maybe having one or two in a list and then back it up with more serious damage dealing tanks. Genuinely though, for the points for the transport though, I feel like this is one of the best transports in all of 40k. For all of cool, I've given it a 2.5. Awesome for mechanised infantry. Rumbling forward to delivering the guard into the fight. For its counterpart for the rapid deployment truck, we've got the Torox. 10 wounds at T8 is a little bit more fragile than the Chimera. I'm probably not quite as overall convinced by its damage output, even with a twin-linked autocannon. It doesn't get a firing deck, and I feel like the advance and drop maybe isn't quite as exciting as the Chimera. I suppose it can get your troops into battle, though it does mean that it's giving up its own shooting, which is perhaps a little bit of a trade-off, though I guess it could be worth it if it gets the squad exactly where it needs to be. Even if it's a bit cheaper, I'd rate the Chimera over this one right now. I'll give the Torox a 3 out of 5. I don't realistically think that it's crazily far behind, but fairly directly outclassed for me. I'm afraid I'm going to give it the 1 out of 3 for Rule of Cool Factor though. I just don't think that Games Workshop did a very good job with those curious sort of track wheels. Certainly a kit that divides the opinions in terms of appearance to say the least. Ah, the Torox, often described as the vehicle the guard looted back from the Orcs. Overall... I agree with all specs on this one. I think it has a little bit of potential, but whereas I will regularly spam chimeras until the cows come home, 
at best, I will consider putting one Torox in with a cheeky baby scouting squad so it could zoom forward and get me maybe an objective early on. But the firepower is really bad. You, th you think the twin link or the auto cannon is half decent, but just the fact that it only fires two shots at BS4 plus and rarely is it going to be a target for things like orders to make it better. It basically doesn't have any firepower worth mentioning. That T8 and uh, 10 wounds might not seem like a big difference between it and the Chimera, but these things are phenomenally fragile in comparison. All those sort of melter guns, those plasma guns, they just wound it that much easier. And so this thing could actually go down to small arms, whereas I tend to find the Chimera actually needs something a bit more punchy to deal with. On the usefulness, I'm going to give it uh, the 2.5 out of 5. And on the rule of cool, I have a few of these in real life and they look a little bit better than they do on the pictures. But still, it, it's, it's a weird one, isn't it? Let's give it the, the 1.5. Part gunship, part flying transport. The Valkyrie is a very cool guard model. I really like them. Got a big soft spot for them. I think it comes down to the Vietnam style door gunners that you can put on them. In terms of its usefulness, it wants to be good. It's trying to be good. But the issue is the aircraft rules in 10th edition are a bit awful. But this thing, if you put it in reserve, isn't going to be doing anything useful till turn three because it can't come in turn one for duty reserves. The turn it comes in, it has to just place on the edge of the board. And then finally turn three, it gets start moving. It means that its capability as a transport is somewhat muted in that role. Its firepower is all right for strafing down infantry. I personally like the last cannon plus the multiple rocket pods plus the double heavy bolters. But you've got a lot of anti-infantry in the guard already. Graph shoot insertion is a really weird ability. It, it doesn't feel like it works very well for me. So in terms of, uh, there is some debate actually though around how the new pivot rules might benefit the Valkyrie if you start it on the board in hover mode. And it is w weirdly durable. It's T10 with a two plus save. It's a flying brick and it's got 14 wounds. So in terms of its usefulness, I think I'm going to give it, and this might be being a bit generous, but I think I'm going to give it a 2.5. It is potentially very durable, and I think that hover plus pivot might have some play, but it definitely needs some uh, testing before I can confirm that. Regarding rule of cool, I think it's quite iconic, and it's been around for a while now in the guard. We've had it since 5th edition, and especially some of its forge world variants like the Vulture, I'm going to give it a um, I'm going to give it a two out of three on the rule of call. I do like the look of it. For the Valkyrie, I must admit, I'm a little bit negative on it. I feel like Games Workshop is trying to neglect it like they have with just about every other flyer in the game. Basically, put it at a points cost where no one's going to take it competitively. The biggest issue is that it's 190 points where it doesn't really do loads more than a standard Chimera for delivering units. You definitely don't want to start it in reserves as then you're delivering transport capacity far too late. So I guess it would usually be on the board and then moving 20 inches and dropping an infantry unit. So basically almost like a sort of first turn drop pod for the guard. For the rest of what it does though, its durability is kind of fine for the cost. But its damage output for 190 points is just ridiculously awful if you compare it to something like a Lehman Ross. That's pretty terrible compared with the almost three chimeras that you could get for the same cost as well. The grab shoot insertion also doesn't really work as well. Really situational depending on where the opponents move their models. I guess it could theoretically help deliver Melter into range, but I feel like Rapid Ingress just isn't great unless you've got a good choice of where it goes. And Cavitor OC0 means that it doesn't really do objectives properly, where more on-the-ground Chimeras and Transports can. Overall, I think it could be an interesting datasheet, but it's just a ridiculous amount overcosted compared with where it needs to be. Probably needs to be a good 50 or 60 points less than it is before most people will consider it, I think. I've chosen to give it a 1.5 for gameplay. For rule of call, cool, I've also gone 2 out of 3. I certainly enjoyed painting up my one. It is a fun miniature. Nice to have a sort of daring insertion type vibe for some guard squads on a special mission. Next up, we have a terrain piece masquerading as a unit in the Age of Defense line. Genuinely somewhat durable at a 2 plus save with 10 wounds and toughness 12. Basically, it can create a line of defense between you and the enemy and gives your infantry a 4 plus invulnerable save when they're getting the benefit of cover from this terrain feature. Again, I feel like it could be a datasheet that could genuinely have good use at a very different points cost, but 145 points is just utterly ridiculous for this. Most lists just can't really afford to spend that sort of points on someone that's got OC0 and doesn't do any damage. 
even if it could potentially screen out some charges and genuinely make your infantry a little bit tougher. I think it's just kind of hard not to take, say, the three extra squads of Kaschan jungle fighters that you could almost afford with this and have them do your screening and be a lot more aggressive and do some objective scoring and things. I've chosen to give it a 1 out of 5 for gameplay. I'm kind of a bit unsure where to put it on the sort of law and feel point of view. I feel like it's nice enough as a little fortification, but certainly not one of the most exciting units of the guard. Plus it lost its quad gun compared with its previous incarnation. I've given it a 1 there as well, I'm afraid. Nothing really against the miniature itself, just not really one of the most exciting ones. I'm in agreement with all specs here. The age defense line is a bit of a, a bit of a bad one. It does have the potential to completely screw over assault armies because you can just make them have to chew through this thing before they get at the stuff behind. But that is so situational and it's 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 kind of big, but it's not big enough where it could cover off your entire army. And particularly fast moving assault armies might even be able just to get around this thing. Some people have told me that it has won them some games, but I think those are more isolated incidents than anything else. The one funny thing about the Age Defense line is technically it can be ordered. The Lord Solar can order the Age Defense line because it does have the Ashton Militar and Faction keyword. I don't know why you would order it, but technically you could give it OC1. But outside of that very meme situation, it's basically a non-starter for me so i am going to give it a i'm gonna give it a one out of five on usefulness and I, I, you know what i kind of like a good fortification so i'll give it a 1.5 on the ruler cool it is the bane blade the super heavy of the guard and one of the most well-known super heavies in the entire game when you slap a bane blade chassis down on the table your opponent knows that you have come to play in terms of their usefulness in 10th edition the various different bane blade chassis are actually potentially very very useful i have used these things in tournament settings and they have crushed they have slapped the problem with the bane blade is not the data sheet the problem with the variance is not their data sheets either it's got a good stat line it's durable as all hell the problem is terrain it's a big bitch and it is going to struggle to get that fat ass around the different terrain features. If you're playing on a UKTC or WTC terrain uh, style map, this thing very well may not get out of your deployment zone. So if you're playing on standard tournament terrain or on particularly dense casual terrain, this thing is its almost like a one out of five. It just can't really contribute to the game. Your opponent could just hide from it. But if you're on a board that allows it to actually, even if it's just got one movement channel, just allows it to contribute, this can genuinely be a five out of five unit, especially with some of the variants like the Shadow Sword. So I am going to give it out, uh, sort of average that out to a three out of five. It's just very terrain dependent. Rule of call, could it be anything less than a three out of three? I mean, if it is, it's just, just heresy. So it's a very, very cool unit, but it is very dependent on what else is going on in the battlefield. Yep, full agreement in general for the Bane Blades for me there. They're definitely in the category of vehicles in Warhammer 40k, where on paper they could be genuinely kind of good, but on some practical battlefields, particularly with fixed terrain in competitive games, and they could just not be able to function. Generally for their raw stat lines, I feel like they do actually compete pretty well with things like the Rosses and maybe the Dawns to some extent, though I feel like they maybe nosed ahead after the points decrease. Perhaps one of my biggest problems with them now though is that they don't have the squadron keyword and that meant that they didn't get the lethal hits from the update. So it's just weirdly gone from them often being able to get lethal hits all the time as they could be something that you might want to stay stationary with a little bit more than some things to suddenly getting that absolutely none of the time, which was a bit sad for them. Between all that, I've gone for the general chassis being a 3.5 out of 5. That might be being a bit generous, really. I do feel like they're just, even if they are in a game where they can actually function, at the moment I'd say that they're outcompeted by the Rosses and the Dawns, but maybe not by all as much as you might expect in more casual games with some more open boards. Now let's deep dive into the different variants, starting off with the classic Baneblade. This one is a Good take all comers unit. The Baneblade Cannon has got a decent strength at AP and damage. It's very reminiscent of the Rogal Dawn's Oppressor Cannon. My issue with the Baneblade Cannon is it's swingy as all hell with only 3d6 shots. Hey, sometimes you'll get 18 shots and you'll just 
turn that unit into a smoking crater. Sometimes you'll get three and it's like just spitting on the enemy. In terms of its ability, Rolling Fortress, it's cool as all hell. Like the fact that you've got like infantry like or units like stacked up behind it using it as cover, sort of reminiscent of that scene from Fury when the tanks were assaulting the tree line. But the problem is that 40k competitive boards aren't exactly sure on cover. And to be honest, you don't really need an extra bit of mobile cover on these boards. So its ability is cool, but not useful. And its gun is a little bit swingy for me. Then we have the Bane Hammer. The Tremor Cannon is a little bit more reliable than the Bane Blade Cannon. It's got the same strength, AP and damage, but it gets 2d6 plus 3 shots. And I do think that plus 3 does give it a nice little safety blanket. It's a little short range with 36 inch range, but that's not too bad. The Tremor Quake, which is the ability of the gun, is just bad. Enemy units, enemy infantry units have to take battle shock tests. It's a sad fact of life that battle shock in 10th edition just isn't all that impactful. So overall, I'm not a big fan of the Bane Hammer. But then we get to the Bane Sword, and oh mama, is this a different kettle of fish. The Quake Cannon fires D6 plus 6, strength 16, AP minus 4, flat damage 4 shots. That is very reliable, that is very strong, the AP is going to kick anything down onto a vulnerable save. If it doesn't have one, it's a good chance it's not going to get a save. And then the flat damage 4 means that even Terminators or units which have got like uh, reduced damage 1 are going to be insta-splatted. And any vehicle out there is just going to get torn in half. I like the fact that the ability armor obliteration also means that enemy vehicles that are destroyed by this, and bear in mind, we're in a bit of a vehicle uh, and a sort of meta, a vehicle and monster meta are going to deadly demise on a three plus rather than a six plus. It means that if the enemy starts stacking up those vehicles and you take one of them out, you can splash out a lot of additional damage from this gun. Bane Sword is one of my top three guard super heavies at the moment. Next is the Doomhammer. Now, I have a lot of people in my community that love the Doomhammer, but for me, I'm just not feeling it. It's got a very low number of shots, D6 plus 3, and its damage is D6. Sure, it's Melter 6, so it could be D6 for 6.5 range, but the half range is 12 inches. And let me tell you, you don't want the Doomhammer that close to the enemy. When you've got fast assault armies that can tear even a tough Bane Blade in half and around a combat, if it's within 12 inches, it better go off. If it doesn't, you're probably going to lose your super heavy. As for its ability, the close range Titan killer, when you shoot an enemy monster or vehicle, you are always considered to be in half range. And that is, that is pretty good. But with it being a 24 inch range, it's still too close for comfort for me. So overall, I think the Doomhammer, it looks good on paper, but I've rarely seen it translate to the tabletop. After that, we've got the Hellhammer. GW can never decide what they want the Hellhammer to do. Sometimes it is a short-ranged armor destroyer, like a big Dimash cannon, and sometimes it's just good for killing infantry. And unfortunately, in 10th edition, they went with the good for killing infantry option. It's essentially a giant Lehman Russ eradicator. But as Allspec said, this thing doesn't get lethal hits. So unlike the Eradicator, which might have some potential to do something good, this thing is just spaffing out a whole bunch of Strength 7 shots. And there's plenty of other places you can get better shots than that in the guard. It does get the ability to shoot in combat um, with its close quarters warfare. But the Hellhammer, it's expensive. Its gun's a bit weak. It's not for me. But from going anti-infantry, let's go to the ultimate in anti-tank firepower, the Shadow Sword. This is really good. It may not seem like it. The Volcano Cannon is a very low number of shots, D3 plus 1. But I have used Shadow Swords competitively. I have used them casually, and they have never failed to deliver. D3 plus 1 shots means on average you're going to get 3 shots. With the fact that it's got heavy and you can put take aim on it, it's actually possible to get this thing hitting on 2. So you pretty much always hit with the shots that you hit with. Its strength 24 means it wounds almost anything on the game on twos. And its AP minus 5 means that any enemy unit is not going to get a save unless it's an invum. Damage 12, insta splats, anything but the toughest of vehicles. And thanks to the Titan Killer ability, it does actually get devastating wounds versus monster vehicles. Sure, 
you're going to have to fish for sixes on a low volume uh, gun. But when it does go through, it slaps. For me, this falls into the same category as the Vanquisher. It could bounce off invulnerable saves, but more often than not, I have found that it has the pure brute force to get that damage through. After the Shadow Sword, we have the Stormlord. Stormlord just wins on Rule of Cool. It's got a Titan Vulcan Mega Bolter strapped to the front of it, and it can transport an entire goddamn platoon of infantry. This is the one super heavy variant that more than any other is crying out for the squadron keyword. It's crying out for them lethal hits. And it's such a shame that it doesn't have it. I think if it had lethal hits, I would put it on equal part to the Shadow Sword in terms of usefulness. But as it is, it's doing a lot of anti-infantry in a faction that doesn't struggle with that. The ability to transport a buttload of dudes definitely allows you to uh, have some meme builds for it. But what I tend to find is if you take a Stormlord and then you, you max out its transport capacity or you max out its very generous firing deck, you've got a unit that could cost in total like half of your points. And that is a lot of eggs in one basket. Last but certainly not least, we have the Storm Sword. I think this is low-key the best guard super heavy at the moment right now. That Siege Cannon has got a reliable number of shots with D6 plus 6. Trend 16 means that it can uh, reliably wound most things in the game. And it's got a good enough AP to reduce the enemy's save by a significant amount or kick them onto their invulnerable. The D6 plus 2 damage actually means that on average, each one of the shots that it gets through is doing sort of 5 to 6 damage, which is very, very nice. And that allows it to insta-splat infantry. It allows it to tear chunks out of vehicles. But the best bit about it is its ability. And you, and you have to say this ability in this way. The Concussive Wave! Concussive Wave means that other units nearby on a 5 plus take D3 mortal wounds it's not super reliable, but it sounds cool and it can add a little bit of extra damage on top of what is already a unit that has a generous damage output. I think I'm going to be a bit more brief on the super heavy variants, given that Mordian's basically said it all for the vast majority of them there. Quite nice to have the flexibility to have a super heavy that really goes after the targets that you like the most. And for the most part, I think I'd agree on the rankings of them. I think that you just want something that can actually do some very general purpose damage and certainly do enough to threaten the enemy heavy hitters as the anti-infantry versions. There's just so much other things in the guard that will deal with infantry really well. So you don't really want to be buying an entire super heavy to try and take down enemy hordes. It's just never going to be all that efficient. I think there's absolutely plenty of them that are good happily run. The standard Bane Blade I think is fun with its bonus demolisher cannon being the biggest thing that sells it to me. Plus a fairly general purpose main gun. I do really like that high chance to trigger Deadly Demise with a Bane Sword. That could occasionally just go up absolutely massively and be a game-changing one-shot right there. If you can scatter D3 mortal wounds on like five enemy units, that's going to be a huge blow to the enemy army with one hit. The Doomhammer and the Shadow Sword both seem fine, a bit more focused against actual anti-vehicle. The Shadow Sword is pretty expensive and will be kind of sad in matchups where there just aren't big vehicle targets to take down though. Killing something like D3 plus 1 Space Marines isn't going to be the best day for it. I fully agree that the Storm Swords are fun one with the Mortal Wound chance and the big hitting damage D6 plus 2. Lots of fairly viable options I think. I feel like it's going to be more a decision of whether or not you go for the overall chassis versus a bunch of Rosses and Dawns though. I think I'd usually go for the Rosses and Dawns in more competitive games for all the reasons mentioned before. Finally it looks like we're wrapping up with the Scion units. First up we've got the Militarum Tempestus Command Squad. I feel like a unit that's been progressively getting better and better throughout 10th edition, being able to order after deep strike or disembarking from transports was such a big deal to these guys. Plus now getting lethal hits on the move against anything that isn't a monster or vehicle is massive as well and makes Scions just so much more dangerous as a threat in their own right. And Tempesta's command squad I think is interesting in that you could go really viably for things like the Feel No Pain, Extra Objective Control or the Master Vox. I think personally I'm just kind of tempted just to load up massively on special weapons and just turn them into basically a big damage hammer alongside a max out Scion unit. You can put a frightening amount of hurt on a bunch of enemy units right out of reserves, grabbing sustained hits one, or even riding with just a single Scion squad in a Torox Prime. I still feel like within the guard they're probably still going to be a niche tactic overall versus the more reliable damage output of tanks and vehicles. They're really nice that they can actually do enough damage that they're genuinely a scary threat once more. 
I've chosen to give them a 4 out of 5 for in-game power. I don't think I'd give them any more than that, just due to how fragile they are on the counter punch. Maybe a little bit of a brave unit to use. For lore and theming, I'll go for a 2 out of 3 for that. I really like the elite sort of drop troop aesthetic of the Scions with the hotshot las guns. They do feel a little bit other compared with the Imperial Guard with their sort of embossed armour and things though. Going down a sort of different trope. Overall, in agreement with all specs here, Scions and specifically Scion Command Squads have had a huge glow up with the balanced data slate. What I like about the Scion Command Squads is how many special weapons you can stack in there. And the flag is a really good choice as well because it means if you take a unit of Scions, uh, they can actually not only do damage, but if they do manage to survive, even a handful of survivors have enough OC to start sneaking objectives away from people. The best bit about the Tempesta Command Squad is not only the order that they can do, but the sustained hits one. Combining that with the main Scions unit uh, Stormtrooper ability, which we'll look at later, that can generate a insane amount of sustained hits. Overall, if you're going to go Scions and you're going to go with them in a damage dealing capacity, the Scion Command Squad is a must have. But I agree with all specs on the four out of five on the usefulness. They are a little bit fragile. Sometimes they drop in, die, and you kind of, if you spent the same points on a tank, maybe the tank would do more damage over the long term, but they can deliver a hammer blow. Uh, rules of cool wise, I like the Scion's aesthetic, but my favorite Stormtroopers are the old school third edition sort of vac suit ones. I'm going to give them a 1.5. They're not bad, and I think they can look very cool, but I prefer that other style. If GW was to remaster them, I'd love, like they did with the Kazakin, I'd love them to bring back the old back Stormtroopers. Now, we mentioned the regular Scion squad there a little bit, so let's dive into them now. Tempest of Scions are one of the best units you can have in the guard. They're an easy S tier, and that's because they are very flexible. You can take a cheap five-man squad with Deep Strike and have them cover off your secondaries. And with Pariah Nexus, secondaries are very, very important, more so than ever. Being able to establish locusts behind enemy lines, being able to do containment, there's just a lot that these guys bring to the table just as a basic five-man squad. And they're so cheap that you can squeeze a couple of them in your army, and, and you should do every single time. It should be one of the first things that goes into your list. But then you can also go absolutely ham with them and have these guys punch well above their weight. A big 10-man squad of these with a Scion Command squad making it a 15-man squad can not only benefit from the previously mentioned sustained hits, but then you have the Stormtroopers ability. This gives the unit inbuilt rerolls of 1, and when targeting enemy units that are on objectives, you get full rerolls to hit. Scions are going to smash the entire area. They're going to kill anything with more than two legs, and they are going to do it with extreme prejudice. An incredible blast unit, an incredible one that can just leave your opponent reeling, and one that is also good as a pseudo indirect fire unit thanks to Deep Strike if you're struggling to get your artillery to work for you. Overall, these are a 5 out of 5 for me because of their flexibility, for their usefulness, and on the rule of cool, I'll stick with the 1.5. Yes, I certainly feel like the Science Squad is pretty amazing for the guard right now. I've chosen to be just a little bit less generous, giving them a 4.5 out of 5 myself. Definitely a unit I'd usually consider having at least one of for the objective rules. I do feel like perhaps they're just a little bit more limited in the scope for deep striking versus things like, say, Gaunt's Ghosts or a Calidus Assassin. Just because you can't be bouncing around the table in the later turns of the game, they all have to be on the board by turn 3. Personally, I feel like the stronger way to use them is for the small unit objective grabbing type rule. I think that that'd be the normal way I'd go for, though, as mentioned, the big command squad damage combo is really good fun and pretty punchy. Plus, could be an interesting enough option to use your reinforcements on, having the squad drop in and then basically the 10 man bit of it recycle to hopefully drop in and either do more damage or do more objective grabbing. Again, for rule of core, I'll give them the same as the command squad for a two for me. Finally, that brings us on to the last unit in the core index for the Torox Prime. Basically, the more elite cousin of the regular Torox, hitting on a 3 plus with some upgraded weapons, either missiles, the Gatling Cannon, or the Torox Battle Cannon. Out of those, I'm probably most convinced by the missile launcher being quite flexible and quite liking the lethal hits that it gets with the Strength 9, means that it actually punches up against vehicles a little bit more. And again, they can be an interesting way to get damage dealing on the Scion units, allowing them to re-roll the wound roll when you disembark from it. 
personally. I feel like while they're interesting, I just feel like they're just not really the way to go for Scions unless you're trying to make a pure Scion army work with more sort of fun and fluff type rules. They definitely can be fairly threatening, though I think I'd just rather have, say, a Chimera with a cheaper infantry squad in it to do the same sort of role. I leave the core damage dealing to other units like, say, tanks and vehicles. It's just not really all that tough for the high points that it has. I'm not sure it really adds enough in terms of its own damage output, even if the re-rolling wounds thing is pretty awesome. Overall, when rating the entire Taurus Prime combo, I'd probably go around about a 3 out of 5 for it. Definitely can be very scary, and you can have Scions hit something very hard. But then once they've done so, I feel like they're probably not going to kill something that's worth their entire points in value. And they're just going to be very easy to remove, both for the Scions on the board and then the Torox Prime as well. Neither of them really being all that tough for the cost. Again, like the regular Torox for this one, this one's going to be a 1 out of 5 for the looks for me. I do find the Torox to be a bit of a peculiar beast. So I'm going to be a little bit harsher on the usefulness of the Torox Prime. I have used these things and I found that they're just slightly too fragile especially considering their points cost also the crack rockets are a little bit of a trap in my mind i've tried using them as anti-tank and they just fall flat although maybe getting the occasional lethal hit might resolve that for me what really overshadows them what really makes me not a fan of them is the chimera does it better i have run scions in chimeras and it felt really good and i've run scions and toxes and it just felt over -costed. And so if my go-to transport for my Scions is not the Scion transport, well, at best I can, that makes this unit less useful, right? So at best, I'm going to give it a two out of five. Now, rule of cool. I'm going to go controversial here. Last controversial take. Come on, I had to end on one with, with, with me. I'm going to give it either a two or maybe even like a three out of three. And the reason for that is not because it looks any better than the regular Torox. It's because there is an old, very obscure piece of lore with the Torox Prime, which says that it has like magnetic sticky tracks. And what Dions used to do with these things is launch them out of the side of starships and stick them onto the side of other starships and use them for boarding actors, like drive around on top of ships and find like hatches that they could uh, they could board the enemy ships with, which is totally stupid, but it's so cool and is absolute 100% A-grade meme factor. And so because of that random bit of law in that one paragraph like three codexes ago, it's gotta get it's gotta get a two or three out of three on the rule of call for me. Must admit I didn't know that about the Torox Prime there. That's definitely the sort of law that works really well, provided you don't think about it at all. With the Scions all talked about though, that just about brings us to the end of our look at the Imperial Guard units in Warhammer 40k 10th edition, at least from the core index anyway. An absolutely massive thank you to Mordy and Glory for taking the time to talk guard with me. Always a pleasure. Fingers crossed we can be doing a few more collabs somewhere down the line. Could be fun to do another battle report at some stage. It might be away in the future, but if we get a chance, could be an opportunity to talk Forge World things. We've decided to leave that for today, given that this video has already exploded to an enormous length. Plenty to be going on with in the core index altogether. Just want to say a massive thank you to Allspec Tactics for having me on. Really enjoyed it and looking forward to another collab in the future. Like you said, maybe a Battleport, maybe some cheeky Forge World units. In any case, it's been really good fun to do something a bit different for this one. Certainly check out Mr. Morley and Glory's channel. I'll leave it links down in the video description. Always great for some regular content for the guard. Otherwise, if you'd like to see more like this, certainly feel free to subscribe to Allspec Tactics as well. I do post 40k videos most every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel and you'd like to see more like this and support the content, I would just like to mention that the channel does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that link down in the video description. Channel patrons do get a few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things come next, an automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you or you'd just like to help support, the link's down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening. And I'll hope to see you guys next time.